Everybody, uh, my name is Andre Kumal, but uh, today I'm not here as an employee of Philip Morris International. I'm here as a host for my two wonderful guests. So welcome to the beginning, uh, the first 30 minutes of the last day of this year's Global Forum on Nicotine. After this session, we still have uh, three more wonderful sessions to go. We will discuss about the role of nicotine uh, in brain disorders. We will have a discussion about the tobacco control playbook and later on, we will look at what we can expect uh, in terms of THR in the next uh, decade or what we hope for or fear. Now, my two guests are uh, Professor Mareva Glover from uh, New Zealand and Dr. Willy Wong from uh, Hong Kong. Dr. Mareva Glover, maybe I start with you. Um, you have, um, I listed when I prepared this morning, I, uh, I, I made a note achievements too many to list <laughs> uh, but you have more than 25 years of experience in trying to reduce uh, smoking related harm and i consider you a pioneer really in uh, in uh, in uh, tobacco harm reduction and also working with uh, with uh, with populations that one doesn't think of i mean first hand for example pregnant women and uh, and uh, other groups um, Maybe you, you want to tell us a little bit more about, uh, about uh, your work and I would also like to ask you, I know GFN, this conference actually has played quite an important role uh, in your personal and professional journey, so maybe we can start with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and good morning everybody, thank you for joining us. So it's actually been 31 years uh, in tobacco control uh, starting as a policy analyst for government in New Zealand. And the Smoke Free Environments Act 1990 had just passed. Mm -hmm. uh, so really a range of roles across that time to see different interventions rolled out. And, and I went to, back to university, did my PhD on smoking cessation because the Māori community, the indigenous mm -hmm. people of New Zealand, in consulting with them, they were like, you know, just don't tell us to stop, you know, you need to help us. So it was clear we needed to have some cessation support. And then that really didn't exist in tobacco control in New Zealand mm -hmm. at that time. So I, I went and did my PhD on that. Um, my background is psychology and... Um, so did, began designing smoking cessation programs and then went into research trialing what would work. Mm -hmm. We've trialed a lot of different approaches over that time and some of them work, uh, yeah. So mainly research since around 2000, mm -hmm. uh, working, researching across a wide range, you know, being involved in randomized controlled trials. In 2015, I came to my first uh, global forum on nicotine, and it was very enlightening. I learned so much about vaping and snus and the heated tobacco mm -hmm. products, and it, it, it really was given the low efficacy of everything that had been tried and was being tried mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, and that you have to accept, you know, a 23% success rate mm -hmm. at, at six months or a 33% maybe if you combine two medications. Mm -hmm. And then here were people I was meeting who had accidentally quit because they tried a vape. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, everything I learned, um, and obviously looked at all of the other research on the toxicology mm -hmm. and everything. I mm -hmm. thought, we have to give this a go. And in a, in a way, I kind of backed the right horse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how successful, how if effective it is to help people stop smoking. Millions and millions of people. What is it? A hundred million, <laughs> yes. you know, people today. 
And then there's all of the ones that have quit over the last 20 years, if you add them in. Correct. It's just fantastic. Very good. Willie, I know you're a psychiatrist in Hong Kong. Mm. Now, we, um, we consider New Zealand almost as a um, harm reduction nirvana because the government mm. is actually uh, very supportive of vaping. Now, the situation is very different uh, in uh, Hong Kong in this respect. But I know you also are seeing patients who have um, a lot going on in their lives. And one of these things is uh, smoking. Could you comment a little bit about your work and what is the success uh, with patients in your practice when, when, when you engage patients mm -hmm. in Hong Kong? Yes, uh, I have a, quite a different background that I'm a psychiatrist, uh, I'm a practitioner in Hong Kong, I see patients and this uh, is the second time I participated in the GFN mm -hmm. and the last time was uh, four years ago uh, mm -hmm. before the COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, pandemic mm -hmm. and um, uh, I learned a lot from uh, during the first time I was here four years ago and this is a very different uh, conference uh, uh, when I compare this with the other academic conferences I participated in my field of psychiatry because mm -hmm. uh, this is not a conference uh, only for academics mm -hmm. or, or professionals but we could also meet uh, people from uh, different areas and they are the stakeholders uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in this field. Mm -hmm. uh, we could meet the people from the industry mm -hmm. and we could also meet uh, uh, the consumers as well. Mm -hmm. We could listen to uh, the experience uh, from the academics mm -hmm. to the experience of the consumers. That, uh, I found this very inspiring mm -hmm. and also eye-opening. And I started to learn about uh, this um, a lot of uh, related uh, policies and uh, signs about uh, 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 the tobacco mm -hmm. and uh, uh, products and mm -hmm. the alternative to tobacco products in this conference and that's why I chose to come mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. and although I come uh, from a place that uh, the, all the alternative tobacco products uh, are banned but um, I think it is uh, still necessary to keep updates with uh, mm -hmm. what's happening in the different corners of the world mm -hmm. because um, the harm reduction is not just a concept specific to uh, tobacco control but it also applies to other areas that I'm now uh, uh, experiencing in mm -hmm. my work. I see patients with mental disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, I see uh, uh, patients uh, coming from the uh, different walks of life and they, uh, many of them are quite underprivileged, mm -hmm. uh, like the sexual minorities mm -hmm. and like uh, uh, people who have uh, substance abuse uh, problems and uh, the homeless and etc. And uh, these are people that uh, are not only having the medical needs, but they also have uh, different uh, problems with mm -hmm. their own uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is uh, uh, smoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why uh, uh, as I'm uh, working in the private setting and also in the university setting, uh, I have the privilege that I have more time to see my patients mm -hmm. and that the more time I spend with them, the more I know about their life as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes uh, I'm not just uh, uh, treating the symptoms of their mm -hmm. mental disorders, but mm -hmm. I also have to take care of the, uh, their whole lifestyle that mm -hmm. I need to give advice, I need to uh, perform assessment mm -hmm. and also give support and assistance. Mm -hmm. and one of the areas is uh, that, uh, we, uh, as we all know from the statistics, that people with mental illnesses have high, uh, higher rates of mm -hmm. uh, smoking. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the, uh, the, the rate of smoking is also higher in the other groups, like uh, the sexual minorities, mm -hmm. the LGBT group, mm -hmm. and the homeless group, mm -hmm. and also uh, people uh, with uh, lower social economic mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that and these are usually the people I meet in my uh, private practice. That's why I think um, although the alternative uh, tobacco products have been totally banned in the place I come from, um, I still need to exercise uh, the harm reduction approach in uh, using other ways in order to help them 
uh, to um, uh, modify their, their own behavior. Like uh, uh, without the alternative tobacco products, we could still use medication mm -hmm. to help them. Uh, some of the patients may want to reduce their smoking, mm -hmm. but they uh, could hardly control their craving mm -hmm. or their uh, internal needs or mm -hmm. the symptoms that they experience if they stop it. So uh, we still need to use the other ways like um, uh, smoking cessation counseling and also I would uh, use a medication to mm -hmm. help them to reduce the, the use of mm -hmm. the uh, cigarettes. And so, and this is uh, uh, not an um, uh, all, uh, all or none approach mm -hmm. because this is always a process, a journey for them to mm -hmm. go through. And harm reduction is like, it, it, it is uh, of this kind of nature that it is not yes or no. Yes. Uh, it is a, a journey that they need to explore. And if they find some ways uh, helpful in uh, reducing the use of cigarettes, then they may think further and they will set another uh, more uh, stringent goal for themselves in order to achieve more in the smoking cessation. So it is like a journey that I go with my patients uh, using the harm reduction approach. Excellent. Marema, uh, the word journey that Willie mentioned, we talked about it some time ago. <laughs> uh, I think uh, you will probably agree with uh, with uh, Dr. Wong. Isn't that right? <laughs> yes, there's, you know, there are triggers and uh, pressures on people, both to give up but to to smoke. And I think, um, sort of along, you know, several um, years ago, and a sort of traditional smoking cessation theory really only focused on all the bad things uh, and why people should stop smoking. But in order to ha understand, as you would know, uh, why people can't stop or uh, why they keep relapsing, you need to understand what the benefits are, what the function of smoking mm -hmm. is for them or any other you know, alcohol or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's serving a purpose. Mm. and just sort of they come in and you say this is bad and it's going to kill you and you know you need to stop which is what really used to happen mm -hmm. um, it, people go away well yeah but what do I do about all these needs I have yes yes, yes. so yeah. it can be obviously you can't learn about everything in one hour you know <laughs> out about a person in one hour so it, it does become a journey and things happen in people's lives they can quit and then the next time you see them they've, they're back to smoking again and it's about learning how to deal with the triggers mm -hmm. in life and circumstances obviously just overtake sometime, yep. the pressure, the stress. Yep. Mm. And Marewa, for those who did not have an opportunity to uh, see, see your talk or watch your presentation yet, it is online so I would encourage our viewers to, to click in the program. Um, if you, the program is very rich this year, so maybe control find Marewa, and you will see <laughs> uh, a video. Tell us a little bit about uh, about what you, uh, the talk you brought to GFN this year. So the session was um, science, regulation, and morality. So there's a lot of discussion about why are people anti. <laughs> these risk-reduced products, why won't they let consumers have access to something that is less harmful? And then there's a lot of talk about, well, it, it's m moral disgust mm -hmm. or uh, they, they think it's bad, mm -hmm. you know, so that it's morals. But uh, it's a lot more than morals. And so I had come across this polyspheric model uh, put forward by a theologian actually and it was that there are you know morals is in there as one kind of sphere mm -hmm. but there are multiple spheres mm -hmm. in which we are making decisions as and as groups where we're making rules we're forming our groups and if someone's bad they get kicked out and, um, you know, so there are multiple motivations for why uh, a group wants these products banned. It's mm. not just morals. And I think, because a lot of people say, why 
why are they doing this? People are dying. Mm. People have, are, mm. are going to get sick with mm -hmm. smoking-related diseases. These illnesses from smoking and the premature death that occurs from it is completely preventable. Yep. But there are all of these people don't want, it's like they don't want people to quit, you know. They're just ignoring that devastation and trauma for families of people ill and dying. So I think we do need to understand the multiple motivations and, uh, and the, what their purpose is, what their purpose is in denying people this exit out mm -hmm. of smoking. One of the words I uh, caught from your talk and from your uh, video presentation was the word tribe. And we would consider uh, New Zealand to be part of the tobacco harm reduction tribe almost. And, <laughs> and they have gone as far as um, now proposing some radical new measures uh, to eradicate smoking, essentially. Uh, nevertheless, they do uh, focus on smoking and leave uh, vaping products essentially, essentially to continue to serve as a tool to get people off smoking. But I know that you have some strong views about these more radical proposals and, proposals and how it affects actually people who smoke. Mm. We, we have vaping and also we have the heated tobacco mm -hmm. product. So there are two products, but because Advertising is banned. Very few people know about the heated tobacco product. And vaping is the main one that mm -hmm. the government has been running a vape to quit campaign, mm -hmm. encouraging people to switch if they can't quit cold turkey. And <laughs> <laughs> the, yes, so the New Zealand regulations, or the legislation that's gone through there was the uh, vaping regulation and then the smoke tobacco regulation. The purpose, the, the end game, is that first get rid of smoking mm -hmm. and then they will get rid mm -hmm. of vaping. Mm -hmm. So there's a problem with that. I mean, that isn't, there's a harm reduction approach, but with a prohibition end. Yep. And there are going to be unintended negative effects of prohibition if people don't do what they've been told to do. So the three radical policies that are coming in from 1 April 2025, uh, the nicotine in tobacco products, the combustible products, will be capped at 0.8 milligrams mm -hmm. per gram. This is very, very low because the yield, what mm -hmm. you actually get from a cigarette, will drop to 0 0.08 milligrams mm -hmm. per gram. So we're talking like a, almost a trace level, below, mm -hmm. below what we, they won't be able to feel it. So I'm very concerned because across the board on 1 April 2025, we don't know how many people mm -hmm. will still be smoking then, but I know from my own research and, and participants that some will. They mm -hmm. don't want to stop smoking, mm -hmm. they're happy smoking. Uh, and or they believe they won't be able to stop smoking. Uh, so however many, it might be 200,000, and in the large global scheme of things, no one cares about mm -hmm. such a small number, perhaps. But I care, and they will be going into cold turkey. Um, some of them have mental health conditions. Smoking is higher p among people with mental health conditions, among the lowest income groups, uh, and the other marginalised groups you mentioned. Well, you, if you take, you mm. know, <laughs> if, you know, if you're going to, they're going to cold turkey, um, yeah, it's, a, it's not going to be good for some people. And mm. it, it could be dangerous for some people. So everyone will go, well, they can just switch to vaping. Vaping, not, uh, not one product will serve all people. And I wish that we had been allowed to have the oral nicotine mm -hmm. pouches. That product we see here at GFN, mm -hmm. the innovation in these mm -hmm. products, the, the new range of products, the improvement in the efficacy of the delivery. Mm -hmm. So there's these other products that, mm -hmm. you know, here in Europe uh, that are advancing and becoming 
they're more and more effective. They're discreet, so nobody would mm -hmm. know you're using them. And uh, New Zealand banned those. I really believe uh, people who smoke need to have a choice. Not, no one product is going to work for mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and these other products exist. It's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. It must be much more frustrating <laughs> for you. I was wondering, really, choice. Uh, so how do you... How do you work in an environment where you are really where that choice is really limited? Now, mm. I presume that the ban did mm. not eradicate the presence or the use of these alternative products, but still it must be very difficult because you cannot even uh, refer people to a product that they cannot buy legally. So mm. how do you deal in your patient's journey with the choice. You mentioned you have medication, but how do you, how do you deal with that? Mm. This is a very difficult question because we <laughs> don't have uh, many choices now mm. and we uh, still need to follow the, uh, the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I just said, harm reduction is a, a very um, sensible and reasonable approach because if you um, ask the client uh, if, uh, to stop smoking, and if this is just a yes or no uh, uh, choice, mm -hmm. and if they think that uh, they have difficulty to stop, and then they will uh, choose to continue. But if we have more choices, then uh, they could have a way to choose. Uh, may not be a complete abstinence, but uh, may be uh, gradually mm -hmm. uh, decreasing the use of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So I think choices are important. If uh, uh, as we are not having uh, the alternative uh, tobacco products at the moment, I will still use the other means mm -hmm. to help them to uh, decrease the smoking or quit mm -hmm. smoking by using uh, counseling, some psychological mm -hmm. uh, intervention. And also, uh, I would uh, also uh, use uh, medication mm -hmm. uh, or a combined approach. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, harm reduction is not an easy approach because it is, all, uh, it is, as I said, it is a journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, the client uh, needs to know what uh, they are doing mm -hmm. uh, uh, during this journey. And uh, it also requires a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, our, uh, we have limited time in, the consultation, in our consultation, uh, there might not be uh, any room for discussion with them about mm -hmm. uh, adjustment of mm -hmm. their uh, lifestyle or behaviors. Mm -hmm. But if uh, we need more time, and we need more resources and uh, to assess the client's uh, motivation, mm -hmm. uh, whether they uh, have interest to try and whether they, have, uh, uh, they are motivated to try mm -hmm. to uh, decrease the use of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we need a lot of resources like uh, we need to follow up the, cl the clients uh, about their progress and uh, we need to tackle their frustration if they have difficulties mm -hmm. uh, uh, during the journey of the harm mm -hmm. reduction and we need to try to um, uh, motivate them mm -hmm. again if they go into a relapse so this is not an easy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, easy approach uh, we need to uh, bring this concept to the client and also we need to assist them uh, and this is, uh, can be very time consuming and it is not just the presence of some products to help us mm -hmm. or uh, some uh, ways of uh, mm -hmm. intervention uh, that we could adopt but it requires uh, good uh, uh, doctor and patient communication. So Willie, I like by the way the choice of words, um, a client, not, mm. <laughs> not, not, not a patient. Mm. but. Uh, so I, 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 I really like that. Well, how, how do your peers view harm reduction? Uh, uh, do you feel um, you, there is more people in Hong Kong like you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, harm reduction is not, uh, is not a term specific to smoking. Yeah. And actually, uh, the, the concept has been widely applied to a lot of uh, mm -hmm. the practices in our medical field, like uh, we use uh, HPV vaccination, mm -hmm. Uh, we use the PrEPs for mm -hmm. prophylaxis of HIV, mm -hmm. and uh, and some people would use a barrier methods mm -hmm. to prevent uh, uh, sexually uh, mm -hmm. transmitted illnesses mm -hmm. and so on. There have been a lot of or, uh, a lot of different. Uh, mm -hmm. 
ways uh, or different practices which, which uh, have been used in the medical field and, and these are all harm reduction. But when it comes to the topic of smoking, it seems that uh, <laughs> this is not uh, a, an approach that is widely accepted by the society. And so I hope um, uh, that uh, more people would learn more about this harm reduction approach. Let uh, uh, people have a choice. Mm -hmm. And this is not just the human rights of the smokers, but also the human rights of the people around. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also concern the environment. Mm -hmm. If uh, after the ban of uh, all the to uh, alternati mm -hmm. alternative tobacco products, and if there is a research and, uh, to, to let, let us know how many people would mm -hmm. uh, switch back to smoking, mm -hmm. then we, ha uh, we would um, know more about the impact of mm -hmm. uh, the blanket ban mm -hmm. and also whether this uh, uh, would be harmful to the environment and, to, uh, and contribute more to the secondhand smoke. And this would be a question that we need to concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I hope um, uh, harm reduction approach is not just uh, um, something that uh, are used in the other areas, but uh, this should also be discussed more in the area of uh, smoking cessation. Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Now, that is all we have, unfortunately, time for today. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your, for your insights and for your time uh, this morning. Uh, we are the first ones to get up uh, this morning in Warsaw, so thank you very much. And I would like to invite viewers now to uh, join us on the next session led by uh, Sud about the role of uh, nicotine in brain disorders. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon again. Welcome all to the, uh, the final day of the 10th GFN in Warsaw here in person uh, uh, in the, for the plenary session uh, to start and kick off the day. Uh, it's an honor for me to have two very distinguished doctors uh, uh, who have worked in the nicotine space for decades and, uh, and have done some phenomenal research in the area. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce the session of the, uh, on the role of nicotinic receptors in brain disorders. And Professor Paul Newhouse uh, is here to talk about it. Uh, if I was to be asked one single line about uh, Dr. Newhouse, it would be that he is the expert on nicotine and brain. And I would like uh, all of us to uh, sit through the next 45 minutes, 50 minutes, uh, where Dr. Newhouse will be able to talk about the exceptional work he's done over the decades in figuring out how and what happens with the nicotinic receptors in the brain and, uh, and what does that mean in terms of uh, the role of nicotine separated from tobacco as it stands. And, and this perhaps is even more important as we have heard for the last three, four days, depending on when you arrived, tobacco harm reduction, how nicotine's misunderstood and how over the, uh, the decades uh, nicotine and tobacco have been conflated, but I think nicotine itself has its own identity. And it's important to understand that identity in a purely scientific clinical context. So, Dr. Pony House, please. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's a pleasure to be here. So, and I wanna thank the organizers of the meeting for inviting me to review with you um, the uh, potential uh, for nicotine as a therapeutic for brain disorders. So uh, let me, uh, so I'm gonna tell you a story about nicotine in the brain and nicotinic receptors and what does nicotine do and how do we understand how nicotine acts in the brain, what work we've done over the past several decades to try to unpack that and to um, think about whether stimulating nicotine receptors in the brain could be used as a therapeutic strategy for different brain disorders. So the story really starts with these two gentlemen. Uh, this is the, the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was awarded in 1936 to Otto Loewy and to his friend Henry Dale and Otto Loewy established uh, the chemical basis of neurotransmission using the famous experiment where he stimulated the vagus nerve of a frog heart 
took the bath uh, and then poured it onto a second frog heart and saw the second heart slow down. And he concluded that there was something in the fluid that was released, and he didn't know what it was. He called it Vagestoff. And it was his friend Henry Dale who identified this as the molecule acetylcholine illustrated here. And this was the first chemical neurotransmitter identified. Um, and they received the 1936 Nobel Prize for this. And this really launched our understanding of how nerve cells communicate with each other. So acetylcholine was the first neurotransmitter identified. Of course, it's not the last. But the brain cholinergic system is uh, something that we have concentrated our efforts on understanding over the last several decades. Um, we understand that the brain cholinergic system has numerous parts to it. Some of those are illustrated here on the left side of the slide with the green, red, and blue nuclei uh, of the brain stem and uh, 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 prefrontal and basal forebrain areas. The ones that I'm most interested in today are going to be the green and red areas. And those uh, supply most of the cholinergic innervation to the cortex of the brain in this sagittal section, sort of halfway through the brain. You can see that uh, those green fibers or projections go all through the cortex. And so almost all neurotransmission in the brain is influenced by cholinergic signaling. With high resolution MRI scanning, we can now see these nuclei actually on an MRI scan, which is illustrated in the upper right section of the brain in these coronal sections, which show you those colored, small colored nuclei, which represent the very tiny structures in the brain that supply all of these acetylcholine. And in, down here in the lower right-hand slide, we, si, uh, part of the slide, we can actually image those projections now using PET radio tracers. Uh, this is uh, one of our uh, scans from uh, using a compound which is picked up by the cholinergic cells. And it, because we have an F18 tracer uh, linked to it, we can now image those projections into the brain. And you can see in the red and green and yellow areas where the cholinergic innervation is the most intense. And that's where we're going to find uh, nicotinic receptors, among others. So let's just drill down a little bit. After Henry Dale and Levy uh, identified this transmitter uh, system, it was quickly realized that there were two types of cholinergic receptors. One of them is a so-called muscarinic receptor, and we're not going to talk much about that today, but that's an equally important, maybe even more important, cholinergic signaling system in the brain. And it involves what, were, what are called G proteins, which is what is broadly termed metabotropic receptors. Nicotinic receptors, by contrast, are fast signaling ion channel receptors. They are more phylogenetically older than muscarinic receptors, um, and they can transduce ions like sodium and calcium. These nicotinic receptors are found throughout the body, not just in the brain. They're found, of course, in, they're found in the ear, they're found in skeletal muscles, they're found in the spinal cord, and in many other places. And they seem to be involved in a variety of neuronal and physiological processes, many, most of which I'm not going to have time to go over today. But nicotinic receptors exist in our skeletal muscles as well. Luckily, nicotine does not work very well at skeletal muscles. Otherwise, we would have uh, seized up and died the first time we tried smoking tobacco. But luckily, nicotinic receptors don't work very well. Our nicotine doesn't work very well at those nicotinic receptors. There's a variety of neurologic and psychiatric disorders that may be associated with abnormalities in nicotinic receptor structure, number, or function. I'm only going to touch on a few of those today. Uh, there's even, there, for example, there's a rare form of epilepsy, which has been genetically linked to a 
mutation in a nicotinic receptor. We'll touch a little bit on depression. We'll touch a little bit on Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. So let's talk, let's drill down even further onto this nicotinic receptor. What does it look like? If you think of the, the receptor as barrel staves around an open pore, so you have these five subunits. If you're looking top down, you would see the five subunits with an open pore in the middle. And those uh, barrel staves are comprised of a, a variety of different subunits. We call them alphas and betas. Uh, there are nine alpha subunits that have been described genetically, and there are at least three beta subunits that have been described. And those can form relatively customized uh, assemblies. And each of those receptors um, has different properties. The most common ones that are in the brain are the alpha-4, beta-2. It has two alpha-4s and three beta-2s and then the so-called alpha-7 receptor, which can form basically uh, from a collection of only alpha units. Nicotine or acetylcholine binds in the joint between those barrel staves, as illustrated in these yellow, these yellow markers. So you can see that nicotine or acetylcholine can bind in numerous places on this receptor and activate it. So the alpha-7 receptor is considered low affinity for nicotine. It doesn't, nicotine doesn't bind as efficiently to it. It's predominantly presynaptic, in other words, before the synapse of the ner nerve cell, and it generates fast calcium currents. The alpha-4 or beta-2 subtype is a high affinity. Uh, it is pre- and postsynaptic, and it is considered the major excitatory neurotrans, uh, uh, nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptor in the mammalian brain. Interestingly, we won't have time to talk a lot about this, but it appears that nicotine can actually get into the cell and actually act as a kind of molecular chaperone to help bring nicotinic receptor complexes to the cell surface. Now, what do these nicotinic receptors do in the brain? Well, they don't necessarily transmit information per se. That's really the role of glutamatergic or glutamate receptors. But they, they act like amplifiers or modulators. Uh, they sit in various positions. Um, you can see where the uh, word nicotine is on this slide and pointing with arrows pointing at the nicotinic receptors. And those act to modulate the actions of other receptor systems in the brain. So dopamine, glutamate, GABA, uh, both excitatory and inhibitory systems are modulated by these nicotinic cholinergic receptors. And so you can see that what nicotine receptors do is they function as a sort of broad modulatory system on a variety of brain activities. Where do these sit? Well, they sit pretty much everywhere there are cholinergic fibers. Um, in this illustration, uh, you can see that the different uh, subtypes of nicotinic receptors are listed here in the left side of the slide on different uh, pathways, neurochemical pathways, glutamate, GABA, dopamine, and acetylcholine itself. So actually, nicotinic receptors can modulate other cholinergic receptors onto muscarinic receptors. So. And you can now localize these receptors using various PET radio tracers. Here is an illustration from a, a group in Germany that's done some really exciting work with a new uh, PET radio tracer, uh, flubatine. And you can see that where those nicotinic receptors reside in the human cortex. So what do these cholinergic systems and nicotinic systems do for cognition? We know, broadly speaking, that cholinergic systems are involved in the top-down and bottom-up regulation of attentional processing. So your ability to listen to me is basically 
improved by frontal cortex, cortex methods, uh, frontal cortex systems which allow you to direct your attention to me or to the screen. And then if somebody calls your name out in the hallway, you will then turn your attention to that and that's what we call bottom up signaling. And so these cholinergic systems are very important for our regulation of attention and, prop and secondarily memory. If there's damage to those systems, then we see robust decline in those systems, in those abilities. So if several, a number of years ago, my colleague Julie Dumas and I proposed a, uh, a role for the cholinergic system in cognitive and brain aging and dementia. And we argued that uh, as time goes on, we tend to uh, have impairments in our ability to regulate attention. We lose resources. Uh, and then the cholinergic system essentially attempts to compensate for that, which allows us to maintain normal cognitive performance as we age. But if that system becomes uh, dysfunctional, uh, such as in Alzheimer's disease, that cholinergic system can no longer compensate and, it, and uh, we now see obvious memory and attention problems. And uh, without taking you through this story in its entirety, that has been the motivator for our attempt to understand the role of nicotinic systems in this process. Now, we started to uh, do a series of studies beginning to try to understand what role cholinergic systems play in this. And this is a slide where we looked at individuals who have early memory complaints and, uh, and then compared those to individuals who did not complain about memory problems. And what we noticed is that the brain activity of people who notice a memory decline, even though they're performing normally, their brains are working harder. And so these orange blobs show you the areas of cortical activity that are increased compared to people who don't notice any memory problems. And this was one of the original motivators for us to say that the, that the cholinergic system essentially attempts to compensate uh, by essentially allowing greater activity in the brain than you would normally have to have. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, we see a failure of this system. The cholinergic system is one of the first things that's attacked by Alzheimer's disease. We're not entirely sure of the reason for that, but it's, uh, it is a very prominent finding. We believe that it's due to the invasion of the basal forebrain by the protein, the abnormal proteins that are present in Alzheimer's disease, amyloid and tau. And we notice that there is a decline in the volume of this cholinergic basal forebrain, as shown in the upper right, and that uh, cholinergic denervation of the brain really tracks quite well with co uh, cognitive impairment, as shown by Nicholas Bonin. And then uh, you can drill down on the neurochemistry of this and find that what happens to these cholinergic cells is they lose their trophic support. They lose the molecules that are necessary to maintain themselves. We even think that the Alzheimer's pathology may directly lead to nicotinic receptor dysfunction and impairment. So as illustrated here by Dinley and colleagues, the um, beta amyloid, the one of the two abnormal proteins, in Alzheimer's disease can actually directly interact with nicotinic receptors, particularly the alpha-7 subtype and the alpha-4-beta-2 subtype, and initially may overstimulate those receptors, but then later actually block them and impair cholinergic function even further. Now, we identified many, many years ago that nicotinic systems might be important for human cognitive functioning. And the way we did this was to use drugs that actually block nicotinic receptors. And it turns out there's a drug that was available to do this. It's an old antihypertensive 
uh, but it actually acts to block the ion channel itself. And we use that drug to sort of create a temporary chemical lesion in the human brain. And so this is from some of our studies in the early 1990s where we were able to show that uh, the uh, drug, which is called mecamylamine, um, impairs cognitive function uh, to a degree even in normals, but can really impair it in Alzheimer's disease patients. So Alzheimer's disease patients are more sensitive to this drug than a match group of normals, suggesting that their nicotinic receptor function is impaired. And this was one of the first studies, maybe the first study, to actually show that blocking nicotinic receptor function in humans actually produces cognitive impairment. We later showed by using brain imaging, uh, MRI uh, functional brain imaging, that we could reproduce essentially an aging phenotype in normal individuals by using mecamylamine. And so when we block nicotinic receptor function in normals, what we do is again make the brain work harder. And we show something called the PASA effect, which has been described in normal aging, where the brain essentially moves processing forward to compensate for impairments in the uh, more uh, parietal and occipital areas of the brain. So as you and I age, we use more and more of our frontal cortex to process information, and essentially blocking nicotinic receptors reproduces that uh, phenotype. Um, we found that this works on, in different cognitive domains. It's not specific to one cognitive task. Here was the same effect seen in, working, in a working memory task. Working memory is what you do when you hold information online for a few seconds to a few minutes. And with uh, nicotinic blockade with mecamylamine, increases and shifts the cortical activity during this working memory task. And then oh, we found that the same thing occurs with episodic memory. So um, mecamylamine increases activity in memory relevant areas for retrieved words. And, and so again, this is reproducing that posterior anterior shift in aging. Episodic memory is what you is remembering what you had for breakfast this morning, what you did yesterday. It's remembering essentially biographical or historical information from the recent past. So blocking nicotinic receptors really does seem to impact brain activity, brain systems, and uh, the actual performance. My colleague Britta Hahn showed in, tw in 2020 that blocking nicotinic receptors also impairs something called default mode de deactivation. The default mode is what your brain does when you have nothing else to think about. So essentially it's going into a kind of idle mode and when you want to respond to something, you have to shift the brain activity out of that idle mode or default mode. <clears throat> and what blocking nicotinic receptors does is it actually impairs the ability to shift the activity from default mode to other modes of cortical activity. So this was the, the first time that, we'd been, that uh, we've seen that nicotine uh, doesn't really change this shift, but uh, definitely mecamylamine, the nicotinic antagonist, blocks the ability to some extent of the brain to shift from default mode to other modes of thinking. Um, now, in general, what do we think that nicotine does? We've talked about blocking nicotine. But what about stimulating with nicotine? What we find, generally speaking, is that nicotine reduces brain activity in cortical areas that are important for a task. And what that means is that it, we believe that the interpretation of that is that nicotine essentially improves the efficiency of the brain. So cortical activity is energy demanding, it's tiring, and so if the brain is operating efficiently, we want the brain to use as few resources as it can to do a task. And what we find with patients with cognitive impairment, for example, is they're using much more of the brain to do the same task 
than a person who's not impaired. And what nicotine seems to do is reduce the activity in task-related areas. And that's a general finding across multiple studies. This is one, again, by Britta Hahn, which shows you that in the blue bars, nicotine uh, decreases the signal quite significantly in all of these different regions uh, compared to placebo. Um, we showed that uh, basically we tried to do the reciprocal, looking in the same task-related networks. And, we, and my uh, colleague, Julie Dumas, has recently uh, looked at 69 older adult, uh, 60 older adults uh, with the age of 60 and showed that stimulating nicotinic receptors with nicotine decreases activation, like I described before, and blocking the nicotinic receptors in those same individuals increases activation in the same network. So we have a nice reciprocal relationship between stimulating and blocking nicotinic receptor function. Um, and these effects may differ by age. So um, interestingly, she's, this is pre very preliminary data, but in comparing young people to older adults, we find that nicotine in the older adults decreases activation like we would expect, but in her hands, she actually found that it increased activation only in the posterior regions of the working memory network. Now, we haven't quite understood exactly the implications of that yet, of whether there's an age difference, but it might be important in understanding the role of nicotine in cognitive function. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, we lose these nicotinic receptors, and this is some of the earliest data uh, on that from the 1980s, actually, from Ken, uh, Peter Whitehouse and Ken Kellar uh, on the left side of the slide and on, uh, on the right side of the slide from Elaine Perry and colleagues in Britain, and basically showing that nicotinic receptors are lost with Alzheimer's disease. Um, this was an independent way of confirming this, uh, by looking at autopsy data. So this is actual auto brain autopsy data showing that nicotinic receptors disappear, essentially, with age and with dementia. And more recently, uh, brain imaging has been able to verify this in living people. Again, this is work by Sabri and colleagues using uh, flubatine uh, uh, PET radio tracers showing that a healthy control has much greater signaling in the brain uh, for, uh, and binding for nicotinic receptors than a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And there's a positive correlation between the um, loss of those nicotinic receptors and different cognitive domains like memory or executive function or attention. So then we started to try to experiment with nicotine itself as a therapeutic strategy. And going back to the 1980s, we didn't have patches or gum or any other nicotine replacement product. So we actually made our own nicotine infusion and we gave it by intravenous injection. Not a very easy way to administer it. And we found in, in a very early study in a few patients with Alzheimer's disease, that there was a very, there was a sort of a sweet spot with the dose uh, that we could find that improved error, reduced errors and improved long-term recall with a single dose of nicotine. We then uh, actually studied one of the first novel nicotinic agonists, ABT418, uh, that was an alpha-4 beta-2 selective agonist and found pretty much the same thing that uh, that there was a dose-related improvement uh, in, with a single dose of uh, this uh, nicotinic-like drug. Um, and we began to think about whether chronic nicotine would have benefits for patients with Alzheimer's disease. The reason for this is shown here by Julie Miwa, who showed that in smokers, they actually upregulate the number of nicotinic receptors in the brain. So smoking actually leads to more nicotinic receptors than a non-smoker has. The reasons for that are complex, and I don't have time to go into all of them today. Suffice to say that what we think happens is that nicotine, again, chaperones those receptor complexes to the cell surface. 
So we started a pilot trial in the early 2000s to give transdermal nicotine to patients with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, this was done in, in uh, 74 uh, non-smoking patients with early memory loss, or what we call MCI, which is the same as prodromal Alzheimer's disease, and we gave it for six months of treatment, placebo-controlled. Uh, this is a very simple study design, basically placebo or nicotine for six months. Uh, we had... Um, uh, a, a greater number of males and females, but the average age was about 75. Um, and what we found was that it, it, it did seem to produce some improvement in cognitive function. So we saw an improvement in um, attention as shown on the left side of the slide. In this slide, uh, down is good and up is bad. And on the right side of the slide, are the effects on memory in paragraph recall and delayed word recall, and showing that the nicotine-treated group in the solid line showed a significant and sustained improvement over six months in these parameters. And so this was very promising uh, results. Um, we were quite pleased to see this. It was safe. We had no significant adverse effects. Uh, that were uh, that led to discontinuation. Um, we found that it in fa it reduced weight a few pounds. Basically, people lose about two kilograms on transdermal nicotine, and uh, there were no significant cardiovascular effects as well. Um, all right, so uh, it was well tolerated. The adverse event rate was similar. And so we basically then went on to a much larger study, which is called the MIND study for memory improvement with nicotine dosing. This study is still running. Uh, you can uh, check out our website at mindstudy.org. This is a much larger trial of 300 to 380 individuals who are being treated with transdermal nicotine for up to two years now. Uh, and we're going to uh, see if we can reproduce the initial pilot data and also see if we can get sustained long-term benefit with transdermal nicotine. This time, however, we're trying to drill down on biomarker, Alzheimer's disease biomarkers in these individuals. We will have MRI scanning of a subset of these individuals, spinal fluid, uh, measurement of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, and we should be able to actually answer questions related to metabolism, metabolic genes, and uh, nicotinic genes as well. So I uh, won't uh, skip, I'll skip over this just in the interest of time, but uh, these measurements of treatment effects are much broader in this study than in the pilot study. So we have 42 sites around the United States that are enrolling patients in this study. And uh, so it's very broad-based uh, nationwide study. So let me then turn, so we should have answers in the next year or two about whether transdermal nicotine in a sustained me method is helpful for patients' memory and cognitive difficulties. And that can be combined with other Alzheimer's disease treatments that are now coming uh, to fr uh, fruition as well, um, and we can talk about those in the discussion. But let me touch on a few other conditions that we're also looking into nicotinic treatment for, and one of these is late-life depression. My colleague Warren Taylor has really focused uh, on this and uh, is now running a very um, exciting trial in late-life depression. Uh, nicotine, re nicotinic receptors have long been thought to inv be involved in mood regulation, uh, and we wanted to test whether stimulating nicotinic function could actually augment the effect benefits of antidepressants in individuals, especially in late life, who may have cognitive impairment as well. And so Warren hypothesized that improvements in what's called the cognitive control network in the brain may be responsible for beneficial effects of nicotine. In a pilot study we published about four years ago, uh, an open label pilot study, this was not placebo controlled, we saw a dramatic and significant reduction in depression scores in patients 
for whom nicotine was added to their antidepressant regimen. So these were individuals that were not well treated by their current antidepressants. Nicotine was added and there was a dramatic reduction in their depression scores. There was a reduced bias for negative cognitive information. And so this was very promising and we went back to the NIH to get funding to do a much larger, more mechanistic and confirmatory trial, which is now running called a Depressed Mind. And in the preliminary data from the first phase of that trial, we are able to confirm that the antidepressant effect is there. We see it again with a reduction in depression scores. And this time, we've been able to look at brain circuit changes. And we've so shown that there is a relationship between nicotinic bl nicotine blood level nicotine metabolites and the change in activity in, cor in cortical circuits. And so uh, Warren and, and colleagues were able to see this change. And this is one of the first pharmacodynamic studies that's ever been done with nicotine. So we're very excited about this uh, process. This is being confirmed now in a double blind phase of this, of this trial. And we hope to have information actually tying the effect of, of nicotine on mood to the change in this cortical con these uh, uh, cortical control systems. So stay tuned for that. Very exciting work. There's some interesting other work that my colleague Alan Lewis has done looking at the effects of nicotine as a serenic, essentially using it to modulate aggressive behavior. He, he, he started this in looking at a rodent model in mice showing that nicotine and nicotinic agonists actually reduce aggression uh, uh, in mice and showing that if you block nicotinic receptors, you lose that ability. And he then did a pilot study in autism patients who were particularly aggressive and showed that there was improvements in uh, uh, irritability and aggression behavior in patients with autism spectrum disorder. And so this is now hopefully being looked at further as another uh, avenue that nicotine may actually act in individuals who have hyperaggressive behavior to reduce that aggression. Um, some colleagues of mine at the, at the University of California, at Irvine and in Berkeley are actually looking now at the ability of nicotine to improve hearing. So it turns out that nicotinic receptors are very active in primary auditory cortex in the brain. And they are involved in modulating our ability to hear different frequencies, different amplitudes, et cetera. And so um, these, these folks at, at UC Irvine and UC Berkeley are now actively looking at changes in hearing uh, physiology uh, in aged individuals. And, and so what they're finding is that nicotine in older people only improves the ability to distinguish frequencies and frequency modulation. And this is, this is some of their pilot data that they uh, produced back in 2021 showing that nicotine essentially only improves performance in those who are impaired, which is a theme that I'm going to come back to at the end. And they are now testing this to again show in the brain where does this effect occur, where in primary auditory cortex is this effect seen. So that's exciting as well. We've done a pilot study looking at nicotine's ability to improve cognitive function in older adults with Down syndrome. Down syndrome individuals are very uh, uh, at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease because they overexpress the amyloid beta peptide due to the, to the extra chromosome that they have. And so we've begun to explore in these individuals what, what the integrity of the cholinergic system looks like and whether nicotine or nicotinic stimulation would improve uh, their cognitive ability. And in this pilot study, just a small N of five individuals, we were able to show that nicotine essentially improves the ability of the brain to recognize that it's seen something before. And we used electrophysiology. Um, uh, these are evoked, uh, as cortical evoked uh, potentials to show that nicotine essentially reverses the aging effect 
in Down syndrome. So that's exciting as well, and we, we, can, we will be continuing that work. And then um, uh, Alex Conley in my lab and uh, Alan Lewis also uh, looked at um, uh, effects in uh, acute effects of nicotine and schizophrenia, looking at the ability to improve attention in an emotional go-no-go -no -go task, where essentially there's a conflict between the emotion and the signal that you're asked to respond to, and showed interestingly that um, that the patients improve, but not the normals. So again, this is a recurring theme here, that if you're functioning normally, nicotine doesn't do much for your cognitive function. But if you're not functioning normally, nicotine may be helpful. Now, Parkinson's disease is ta has been talked about. We did a study in Parkinson's disease about 30 years ago and found some acute benefits of nicotine. There's been a lot of controversy on this over the years. Some recent data has shown that there is a reduced risk of Parkinson's disease by smoking status. This was a study of 30,000 British physicians followed for up to 65 years, showing that um, smoking is, is protective, although the reasons for this are somewhat obscure. There have been some negative studies of nicotine in Parkinson's disease. Um, but this one study that uh, was done in 2019 did show improvements in freezing of gait and falls, which, is a, which are two major problems in Parkinson's disease. And the last slide I have then <coughs> uh, about data is, could nicotine be actually helpful in long COVID? And so a number of us have begun to think about ways we could improve cognitive function in patients who have brain fog or cognitive difficulties following COVID infection. And although this is not, this work hasn't started yet, we've proposed to the NIH to essentially combine um, brain training, computerized brain training with nicotine as essentially an augmentation strategy to improve cognitive function in patients with long COVID. And so uh, whether that work uh, gets we hope to get that work started in the next six months or so, but there's good reason to think that nicotine may also augment uh, brain plasticity, which can then be taken advantage of by cognitive training or cognitive rehabilitation strategies as well. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to then leave you with a couple of points, which is this, that nicotine effects on cognitive performance depend on your baseline. So, and it depends on the difficulty of what you're being asked to do. If your performance is high at the top of this upside down U-shaped curve, nicot and uh, stimulating nicotine, nicotinic receptors will not improve it further because you're functioning near the top of the curve. It will only impair performance actually. But if you're, um, if you're doing a difficult task and you're not functioning at the top, then stimulating with nicotinic re uh, receptor, uh, nicotinic receptor stimulation with nicotine will actually improve performance. And so the relationship of task difficulty and baseline is very important to understand uh, nicotine effects. So in other words, individuals who are functioning very well are not likely to benefit further by nicotine. But people who are not functioning to their optimum will see a performance enhancement with nicotinic stimulation. And the, and the question that we're always asked to deal with is what's the effect size? Is the effect big enough to warrant treatment with a nicotinic drug? And that remains uncertain for many conditions. And then what is the adverse side effect risk, right? In this, uh, cur these two hypothetical curves on the right side of the slide, uh, from, you can see that the red line would be adverse side effects, and the green line would be this improvement curve. And what you don't want to do is get past the intersection of those two lines. Essentially, you want to always look at the trade-off between uh, the risks or the adverse effects and the benefits of any cognitive enhancing drug. So in summary then, nicotinic receptor modulation or stimulation appears to be important for maintaining attentional function and memory efficiency. 
We're investigating a number of different disorders, including mild cognitive impairment, early Alzheimer's disease, late life depression, and others. There's a potential to explore synergism of nicotine with other approaches to treating cognitive consequences of different disorders like SARS-CoV-2 infection or other disorders that involve attention, executive function, and memory. The degree to which nicotine is beneficial, which is that effect size conundrum, and the appropriate dosing still remain to be established. And so with that, I will uh, turn this back over to our chair. Thank you so much, Paul. That's a, that's a breathtaking uh, presentation in terms of the, uh, the anatomy and physiology and the, uh, the pharmacology of nicotine even. And uh, the, the studies you mentioned that you've been de doing over decades, uh, it'll be great for us to have some, some discussion about that later in the, in the session. But I would like to uh, hear from Dr. Konstantinos Fasalinos, uh, given his work in the area of tobacco harm reduction, but also what struck me was uh, one of the last slides you presented regarding uh, COVID and, uh, and some of the, uh, the connections that were being drawn then regarding nicotine and the role of nicotine uh, in, the, in the sort of post-COVID world. Uh, maybe, uh, Konstantinos, uh, in your response to uh, Dr. Newhouse's presentation, you can start with that and also anything else you want to comment on, please. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Neuhaus. It was an excellent presentation that didn't cover the whole story of nicotinic receptors. He mainly talked about the functional part of the brain, but there is also an immunomodulatory effect of alpha-7 mostly uh, nicotinic receptors, not only in the brain, but throughout the body, through the nicotinic, uh, the whole energetic anti-inflammatory pathway, but also in the brain, Many of the brain diseases are basically inflammatory diseases. So there is a whole different chapter uh, with nicotinic receptors. It's, it's exciting. Nicotinic receptors are present throughout our body. They are also present in the, in the lung. And that's why we, we did uh, uh, the studies looking at what's happening with smoking and COVID. I saw you, you presented one of my um, hypothesis there about the interaction between the uh, alpha-7 nicotinic receptors and COVID. Uh, now, um, when you talked about uh, late life depression, uh, that reminded me of a joke that I was hearing several years ago that people shouldn't smoke until the age of 75. And <laughs> after the age of 75, it wouldn't be a really bad idea to start smoking. Of course, we're not suggesting anyone to smoke. But that was a reference to the late life depression and uh, how probably nicotine may, may, may affect it. Now, um, you know, what is, um, uh, what, what is interesting is that the mode of nicotine intake from smoking is very different from the mode of nicotine intake when we try um, a pharmacological intervention. So uh, what happens with smoking, and everyone I suppose knows that, is that we have peaks and troughs, we have spikes of very high nicotine uh, and ra very rapid increase in nicotine concentration that acts on the brain. Uh, then uh, over time, nicotine levels go down. Uh, then it goes up again whenever you smoke. Uh, this is something that cannot be replicated when you uh, deliver uh, nicotine uh, either intravenously, of course, that can be done only acutely, but mainly through transdermal patches because that's the main uh, mode of delivering nicotine in, uh, in uh, interventional studies. Um, and we know that there is the issue of desensitization of receptors uh, everywhere concerning nicotine. So when you give a lot of nicotine, nicotine is present in a steady state, then the receptors get desensitized. There is some form of a tolerance. Now, uh, interestingly, in medicine, we always uh, try to maintain a steady state concentration for all medications we, we, uh, we give to patients. But that probably is not the case with nicotine. And that's why it's been quite tough to reproduce the effects of smoking on Parkinson's disease that you mentioned. And the British doctor study was a huge study of 65 years of follow-up with 30% uh, reduced risk of uh, developing Parkinson's disease among smokers. And the benefit was winning off uh, with uh, more years of quitting smoking. 
Of course, as you understand, we cannot suggest smoking as a therapeutic or a prophylactic intervention, but it gives new insights. Now, I'm not sure if the mode of um, the, the, the way of delivering the uh, nicotine uh, through patches, which uh, result in steady state concentrations over time, is the ideal way of doing that. In some cases, I remember my friend Zach Lehuzek, who did a study in the late 90s in Parkinson's disease, they had to uh, administer very high doses of nicotine in order to see an effect in Parkinson's disease patients. If I remember well, up to 72 milligrams per day, which was, you know, quite well tolerated if you gradually increase the dose, but still it's quite high, much higher than what we suggest for smokers. Anyway, it's, it's a really exciting field, which is still at the beginning, I must say, in terms of the therapeutic, the potential therapeutic applications. But imagine what's going to happen if uh, uh, an effect is observed, for example, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and what the effect is going to be in society, because, you know, people are terrified of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Because, of course, it's, it, it, it's, it's a disease that largely affects human dignity, and, and, and it's really torturing for the patients. So um, uh, imagine how the perception about nicotine is going to change if an effect on Alzheimer's disease uh, would be found, uh, especially for primary prevention, which is much more important than secondary prevention. Now, concerning COVID, yeah, uh, we started with the observations in smokers. We were seeing very few, uh, very small proportion of uh, patients hospitalized with COVID in China being smokers. And knowing that China has a large uh, smoking rate, a very high smoking rate, 50% of men still smoke there, uh, that was unexpected. And that is what started our work. And uh, I had to look quite hard into the literature to uh, try to uh, create a link between the whole energetic anti-inflammatory pathway and COVID, the, the, the graph that you showed in one of your slides. Uh, we didn't have the funding to proceed forward. I'm really glad that you are looking to uh, performing a study for post-COVID uh, because it might work and it's... Uh, mainly brain disorder that is affecting a lot of people with brain fog. So uh, the prospects are there, but there are problems. And the main problems are that uh, people don't like doing research with nicotine. You know, there have been a lot of hurdles in scientists who have been working uh, with nicotine for um, uh, mainly neurological problems. Um, there is a lot of prejudice against nicotine. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Neuhaus uh, if he has seen such prejudice from his colleagues or when he has applied for funding uh, for studies involving nicotine. Well, I, I guess the short answer is yes, but, right? So we try to make a very evidence-based argument for stimulating with nicotine. Um, and as you may know, I'm sure you know, Constantine, that there, were, there was a lot of pharmaceutical interest in nicotinic receptors beginning in the 1990s into the 2000s. And there was an attempt to develop a whole series of, of recept, celeb, subtype selective receptor agonists, all of which failed. And they failed um, in a way probably because they were too selective in fact, and nicotine may be a better drug because it activates a multiple subtypes of receptors. And so I think I've been able to make the argument with data that this is worth looking into. You know, I think we do run into challenges when we recruit patients for these studies, but after we explain it carefully, we usually can get around that. I'm really glad because when we try to publish our data, on smoking and uh, COVID, and we only discussed about um, nicotine replacement therapies. We never mentioned the word uh, tobacco harm reduction, and of course, we never replied that smoking should be used uh, for COVID. We had a lot of disagreement from uh, journal editors who had nothing to do with uh, tobacco and uh, smoking research. Um, uh, 
they, there was a lot of resistance in uh, just uh, our words suggesting that nicotine might have a chance and should be tested clinically. Clinically, I, I remind you that there were several anti-inflammatory agents that were tested that were supposed to be a contraindication in the case of infections, like um, interleukin uh, receptor blockers and um, uh, antibodies. Uh, but th there was a lot of reluctance, you know, when we suggested that nicotine in the form of replacement therapies, that was the only thing we mentioned, we never, I mean, mentioned harm reduction products or anything commercial. We only discussed about pharmaceutical nicotine. At least at the beginning, there was a lot of reluctance. But then after that, I mean, in the last, in 2021, there are more than 15 studies from throughout the world, from Korea to the US, to the UK, everywhere, showing that there is something happening with smoking. We don't know if it's nicotine or not, but there is something happening with smoking and COVID. A large UK study with more than 8 million participants, they found that heavy smokers have an 88% lower uh, chance of being admitted to an ICU for COVID. Um, the same in a, a study in California, I think 2 million participants. Studies in Israel, studies in, in France have found the, the same. We don't know if it's nicotine. We hope it's nicotine, because if it's not nicotine, then you can't do anything because you cannot suggest smoking as a therapeutic <laughs> intervention for, for well, COVID or for anything else. Yeah, constant loss. I think that's a great one to uh, kind of maybe perhaps zoom back into, I think, COVID and, and the, the findings from the COVID times. Uh, and I'm so glad, Paul, that you are looking into that as a potential uh, the long COVID aspect of your research uh, may hopefully shed some light on this. And I'm hoping that gives us clarity on the potential role of nicotine in any of these things. I wanted to pick on something that Konstantinos said earlier, and then I want to open this up for the audience to ask questions. I'm sure there will be a lot of things that they want to ask about your studies in this area and so on. But taking the advantage of being a chair, I have a chance to ask you one question. And that is the, uh, the, the point you mentioned, Konstantinos, about how in your studies, the, the mind study or the depressed mind study, transdermal patches are being used, and that's a steady dosage of nicotine, 7 to 21 milligrams, you've said there. Uh, of course, consumers uh, who use, so in the British study, for example, they were smokers, and, and they're using it as, as per need, I guess. Uh, would there be any difference, as per your understanding, of how nicotine works in the dosage and the, the peaks and troughs of nicotine in the, in the blood and hence the brain that may have a role to play in terms of not just the nicotine's role on the receptors, but also potentially the reward aspect of smoking and, uh, and, and the lack of nicotine and hence the dopaminergic system taking over. So is there anything there that may be causing that to be a bit more effective than just plain transdermal delivery? Does that make sense? Well, I can, I can address part of that question, right? So one of the major issues in any type of CNS drug development is how much time does the drug need to be on the target? Do you need to have a drug on a target all the time, some of the time? Exactly what do we need? Because we're always trying to reproduce normal physiology, right? And normal physiology does not necessarily represent constant stimulation or what we call flogging receptors, right? So we, we really still don't know very well with nicotine how to do this. Do we need time on, how much time do we need on the target? Um, now, I, I didn't get into the details of this, but in the MIND study, we actually have the patient take the patch off when they go to bed. And so they are not wearing a patch at night because, and this is actually for a very practical reason, which is that we think that nicotine can disrupt sleep a little bit in elderly patients. And so we actually have them remove the patch after 18 hours uh, because we don't want, uh, we've, we just anecdotally have noticed that patients will complain of sleep difficulty if they have the patch on through the night. This is a 24 hour patch that we have to use. The other difference is that we really don't know what the right dose is yet. Still, it's odd to say this, 
But um, the data that Warren Taylor in my, uh, in my center is developing suggests that we actually may need to give less nicotine actually than we have been, that actually less may be more in this situation, that actually there does seem to be this upside down U-shaped function, and if we push the dose to 21 milligrams, we actually don't get worse, worse improvement, not as good improvement, as if we back off. And so it may well be that, uh, as Henry Lester suggested to me 10 years ago, he said, Paul, you're giving way too much nicotine. And I said, Henry, you might be right, but I need to know how to decide that. I need data. And, and so I think we're beginning to see that now, that in this case, less may be more. So we're still trying to work out time on target, and appropriate dosing. Thank you so much for that. I think that's uh, the reason I was asking that was, of course, uh, there are products now which deliver nicotine not with the accompanying smoke, and, and hence wondering if, if the transdermal patch, and, and just wondering in terms of uh, compliance, of course, these are part of a study, so they are pretty good at compliance, you reckon? Huh? Well, so, yeah, when, and I was, exp I was talking about this with... Uh, 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 I think with Helen the other day, which is that, um, you know, you use a patch because it's easy, right? It's uh, compliance is easy to monitor, um, dosing is easy, uh, you don't have to fuss with a administration system like a vaping device where it has to be used repeatedly or something oral in the gum or, or in the mouth. Um, so patch is very appealing, especially for cognitively impaired patients. That makes sense. I'm going to just uh, look at the audience, and I'm hoping that there are, there are quite a lot of questions. So, uh, gosh, who started first? May I start with uh, Caroline, then Clive, then Andy, and then the gentleman, please. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn Beaumont, General Practitioner Australia. Uh, just regarding the PASA-type normal age-related cognitive decline, so we hear of other things, non-nicotine things that can help, such as doing crosswords, learning a new language, an instrument, and exercise. Um, do you have any thoughts on what sort of activities specifically will help improve nicotine um, receptor upregulation, so activities which could be really beneficial in helping then maybe with lower dose nicotine for cognitive decline. So let me be clear here. Are you asking how we could show that other mm. activities interact with nicotinic receptor systems? Yes, yeah. that's right. To help maybe augment nicotine wow. therapy. Wow, that's... Uh, <laughs> if we can get funding to do that, Carolyn, I'll do that study with you. Um, because uh, that would be a challenge. I mean, I think it's an interesting question, is can we augment cholinergic functioning through non-cholinergic means? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. It, you know, the most practical way to do that would be to use PET radio tracers, um, e either uh, more general PET radio tracers like FEOBV that we're doing, um, we are in the early stages of trying to draw relationships between the anatomy of the basal forebrain and these cholinergic projections and other factors that influence cognitive aging. So stay tuned. Can I sneak in one extra question? Are there other transdermal ways of administering nicotine except for patches? And I'm thinking specifically of gels similar to maybe testosterone gel therapy because the rashes associated with patches could be quite a deterrent for people. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with that, I'm afraid, Carolyn. We have some studies to do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolyn. Clive? Thanks, Ed. Hi, Clive Bates. Um, two questions, really. First, is there like a review article of all of this stuff? And if there isn't, it would be brilliant if there was. And then secondly, because we're lazy. Um, secondly, though, there's people already using nicotine, smokers, vapors, snooze users, and what have you. And the, this knowledge that's amassing here can't be unknown and can't be forgotten or ignored. Um, what... What should people be told, told about this stuff? What should they be advised? I mean, I re I'm just remembering back to the early stages of the COVID 
um, uh, epidemic. And the first results were coming in that smoking appeared to be protective in some ways. And it always seemed to be that whatever's the question, the answer is quit smoking. I remember saying to people in the U UK smoking cessation community, hang on a minute here. You may, you may be advising people to remove something that's protective. And it, it seems to me that, um, you know, in the, the, the sort of late life depression here, if there's, there's people smoking or using nicotine, even if they've never been told to do that or advised to do it, it may just be working for them in some way. Or, it, it, you know, or pe people who are medicating themselves, with, you know, who, who have Parkinson's disease and just finds that, find that this works. Now, we can't unknow those findings. So what should people, what should we say to people about these? Well, so my thought was the first part of your question, is there a review on this? Um, uh, not exactly, but maybe I can get my postdoc to start working on one. No, I did. <laughs> um, but what should we tell people? Well, I think one has to be a little bit cautious here because um, the action of a drug or a substance as a preventative strategy is different from that as a therapeutic strategy, right? So we know, for example, that um, women who take estradiol uh, right after menopause have a reduced risk of developing dementia later. But when you now turn around and use estradiol as a, a preventative treatment in those older women, it doesn't work, right? So one has to be cautious about saying, well, because something's associated with reduced risk of X, that means that using it therapeutically will help. That's a sep those are two separate questions. They're the, the physiology is different, and you have to test those independently. And so I, I think what we tell people is that we're still trying to unpack what the role of nicotine and, uh, is therapeutically, which may be quite different from its ability to prevent something. So for example, the Parkinson's disease is a good example. Smoking seems to be, I mean, there's very rigorous studies now that show that smoking is associated with a lower risk of Parkinson's disease. But most of the therapeutic studies have not succeeded for one reason or another. Now, you know, you and I can look at those studies and say, well, they didn't look at the right thing or they didn't look at the right dose, but it's not a simple metric. And so I think, and I was, telling, I was talking to Helen about this yesterday, we have to be comfortable with complexity. So if I can just, a, a quick follow-up, because we do give people very unequivocal advice about quitting smoking and often quitting nicotine. You know, it, it's not like there's any doubt in the message that comes about smoking cessation, vaping cessation, nicotine's all bad. So whilst there is complexity on this sort of therapeutic side, there's no complexity or nuance in the, in the messages about what behavior to follow, even if that behavior, without you ever intending it, or even knowing it, is therapeutic and beneficial, as with the depression case. Andy, uh, can we get the mic there to Andy? Before it goes to Andy, just uh, if there are any online questions, I can't see them on this iPad. So can somebody come and just help out with the iPad if it's... Yeah. Hi, Andrew Manson. Um, looking back in the days when indoor smoking was allowed those sports that required high mental focus such as poker players darts players snooker players they pretty much all smoked and in the modern world the use of snooze amongst sporting athletes footballers hockey players is reportedly on the increase is there evidence that um, in healthy brains nicotine can help people doing very complex tasks to focus on the task and to perform better. This um, is not my area of focus, but I believe the clearest answer would be that in relation to task difficulty, that nicotinic stimulation will be beneficial uh, 
So the more performance is lower at baseline, nicotine can bring it up. Um, and that was that slide, right, the sec, uh, second or third from the end, was is that as a task is difficult, you will see beneficial effects of nicotine. If a task is, task is easy, you will see actual impairment. Um, so it depends on the task. I suspect that your observation is a good one, right, that sports, that things that require significant concentration or sustained attention, right, uh, do benefit from nicotinic stimulation. And that was shown even, um, you know, 30 years ago by Keith, by the late Keith Wesnes when he did his uh, PhD with David Warburton. He showed that nicotine seemed to improve the performance of high attentionally demanding, boring tasks that required maintaining intentional focus. So yes, I think there is evidence for that. Yeah, but I think that you need to be a bit cautious because if someone is a smoker and then he engages into a complex activity or an activity that needs a lot of attention, then uh, smoking abstinence during this activity is going to deteriorate his function. So they were smoking during playing poker or doing any other activities that required attention because they have been smokers and getting deprived of smoking when you are um, um, dependent on that and uh, you perform a complex activity, this will uh, result in a decline in your performance. And uh, something about what Clive said before, I just wanted to make a very short comment. What's, there's a big difference between primary prevention uh, studies using nicotine usually uh, to show benefits, for example, in Parkinson's disease, and uh, interventional studies uh, administering nicotine through patches. And the big difference is the way that nicotine is delivered and absorbed uh, by uh, the, the subject. In one stage, we have steady state concentrations uh, in secondary prevention trials when we do it therapeutically. Uh, in primary prevention, when you look, we look at smokers, smokers obtain nicotine through a very, very different way. And we are not sure if this plays a role or not in uh, any different effects. I think that's, that seems to be the recurrent theme here, that uh, what is done in terms of delivery in a medical, medical clinical setting versus consumer behavior. Uh, John, there's a question uh, here from John, please. And then there's one from Eliza later. Hi, John Summers from the UK. Uh, firstly, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your bravery in taking this subject on. Um, the reason I say bravery is um, my father um, developed very rapid onset Parkinson's, very rapid degradation Parkinson's in 2015. Uh, in February 2015, I took a number of studies to his medics and said, look, you know, he's developing symptoms which I believe may correlate with the studies that were um, published in the uh, Japanese uh, Journal of Internal Medicine. Um, I had no reply from them. I took, went and actually visited them physically. And I was threatened with being banned from the hospital and seeing my father. Six weeks later, he died. So how, this is now leading to my question, how do you see us overcoming the militaristic, and I mean, in, in these cases, they hadn't even read the studies. They just saw the fact that I mentioned the word nicotine and I was threatened with being physically banned from the hospital. How do we come overcome this militaristic, you know, absolute bias against any form of, of uh, nicotine intervention in, in illness? A quick answer, maybe? I, 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 I'm, I think the best answer is data, right? So um, if you have data that shows a beneficial effect with reasonable tolerance and safety, then I think physicians will listen. Um, I do agree there's a lot of bias out there, but um, I, my impression is that you can overcome skepticism and bias with data. And uh, once that data is real enough, I think people will start to listen. There will always be people um, physicians, medical professionals who say uh, nicotine is an addictive substance. Well, as somebody said yesterday, so is morphine, but we still use it, right? 
And so, um, and actually nicotine probably isn't by itself very addictive at all. Um, but, but I think you overcome it with data. Thank you so much. You um, know, it, it's, it's not only just one, one sentence. It, it's not, the, the misinformation is not only related to um, limited evidence on the efficacy of nicotine in such conditions. The even bigger problem is that most of physicians consider that the giving nicotine to an elderly person is a very risky thing to do. They, uh, although all studies, um, especially for neurological disorders, which, were, which involved delivering nicotine even at high doses in people who have never smoked. And they were elderly with cardiovascular disease, with other risk factors. Nicotine was very well tolerated, if given, of course, in a careful way, not with a maximum dose from day one. But most physicians think that it's very risky to provide nicotine to an elderly person with other conditions, particularly with cardiovascular disease. Although all the studies are showing that it's very well tolerated, and if there are any side effects, it's usually some types of uh, arrhythmias which are not even causing any real, real issues. So uh, there are a lot of hurdles and a lot of misperceptions that need to be um, removed from the mind of, of physicians yeah. throughout the world. Thank you so much, Constantinos. Now, I'm conscious there are two questions that have come online which I can now see. There's a question from Eliza. So may I request Eliza, keep it very short, brief, if you don't mind, and let's not answer it before we have, I've had a chance to ask both questions from here as well, Paul and Constantinos, please. Certainly. Um, hi, I'm Eliza. So my question is for all the doctors on stage. In terms of the evidence base on post-intervention effects of nicotinic receptor stimulation, or are the, those effects really limited to the continuous stimuli that are being introduced? And I guess specifically to Dr. Newhouse, how will you be uh, registering that following the uh, medical tapering in your own mind study? Thanks for that. Uh, the question online I have here, which is rather interesting, is Dr. Newhouse, in your research on the therapeutic potential of nicotine, have you explored the possibility that the administration of nicotine in conjunction with the harmful chemicals present in tobacco smoke via combustion mechanism may have unique or synergistic effects on cognitive function or neuroprotection? Uh, it's rather edgy, I think, but uh, it's, it's worth uh, potentially answering or not. It's a, your call. So I'm not sure I fully really understand your question. So what you're asking is, do I, am I looking at prolonged effects of nicotine after the, we've stopped the administration? Is that what you're asking? I'm a little bit unclear what you're asking. Can you try that again? Yes, sorry. Um, yes, so if the positive effects, either in your past studies and in your current study, I guess looking forward, are registered, or if you're noticing or observing anything following the introduction of uh, the external stimulus being uh, nicotine. Is that dependent on that, or are there any lingering positive effects, such as, for example, if uh, it would be introduced as a COVID therapy or post-COVID therapy, would these patients be looking at having a, a nicotine ingestion for the rest of... I see what you're saying. ...wanting okay. to experience yeah. that, or could it be temporary? Right. So, uh, I mean, that's a great question. You know, do you need to have nicotinic stimulation for a long period of time, and if so, how long? Um, and these are, we really have com no answers for this. <laughs> I mean, I'm sad to say. Uh, the reality is that um, we are attempting to see if the effects are sustained after cessation of treatment, but those attempts uh, to study that have not been well thought out yet, and so we actually just don't have data. And then w with regard to the online question about other constituents of tobacco, we have not investigated that. Fair point. And look, I'm conscious that there is another session right in 10 minutes, and it's to be fair to the next session. I don't want to take this any more further. But look, it's been great to get such deep, insightful uh, presentation from you, Dr. Paul Newhouse, and great response by Dr. Konstantinos Fasilinos. Uh, a r round of applause for the, uh, the two doctors here, please. I, I do hope to see that review article uh, anytime soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this session on the Tobacco Control Playbook. Uh, my name is Martin Cullip, I'm a uh, harm reduction advocate and uh, I'm a fellow at the uh, Taxpayers Protection Alliance Consumer Centre in Washington DC. I've got uh, a great panel lined up for you. I just want to mention that uh, there is translations of this panel into Russian and Spanish. Uh, if you want to take advantage of that. And also mention that you're being given feedback forms on the way in. Could you make sure you fill those out if you, if you intend to fill one out before you leave? Uh, no point just taking it home with you and not, not giving your, your uh, thoughts on how, how the whole conference went. Uh, so I'll, I'll introduce the uh, guests I have with me today. First, in no particular order, uh, we have Jerry Stimson, should need... No introduction, really. Um, public health social scientist with over 50 years' experience of research and advocacy. He's one of the founders of Drugs Harm Reduction in the 1990s, and he's director of research policy and policy at Knowledge Action Change, and a co-founder of the Global Forum on Nicotine, which we're all at. Uh, to my right, we have Asa Saligupta, a former smoker, who smoked for over 37 years, and have tried almost all quit method methods and he found vaping about 10 years ago and he founded ENDS uh, Cigarette Smoke Thailand, ECST, seven years ago and is the current director. And we have Nancy. Nancy is the, the founder and executive coordinator for CAFRA, the Coalition of Asia Pacific Tobacco Harm Reduction Advocates. CAFRA supports consumer THR advocacy organizations and activities throughout the Asia Pacific region and beyond. And lastly, we have Konstantinos Vasilinos, physician and senior researcher at the University of Patras and the School of Public Health, University of West Attica in Greece. He's been conducting laboratory, clinical, and epidemiological research on smoking, tobacco harm reduction, and e cigarettes as principal investigator since investigator since 2011 and has published more than 90 studies and articles in international peer-reviewed peer scientific journals. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, well there was a perfect example last week um, in the UK, uh, the Guardian newspaper ran an article on Mark Oates of this parish who was, who was on panels yesterday uh, uh, and the day before uh, and they basically accused him of being um, part of industry plot to, uh, to spread messages around social media about vaping. Um, the accusation went, if I understand it correctly, that Mark was running uh, WeVape, a consumer association. He later joined the Adam Smith Institute in London as an unpaid fellow. And the Adam Smith Institute about 10 years ago got some funding from JTI, which represented about 3% of their turnover. So... Therefore, apparently Mark was spreading these messages and he was, it was all funded by tobacco. Uh, I spoke to him and asked him, you know, what were these messages? And he said he, he bought some adverts on Twitter and the sum total of the adverts was £79. So <laughs> this is the kind of thing we're talking about. At the same time, uh, on the other side, we have Bath University was found out last year to be an intermediary between... The Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Investigative Desk, uh, which is a Dutch-based organisation which writes articles uh, which are very anti-vaping. Uh, and they had a, um, a contract with them where they weren't allowed to say that, uh, that they were getting funding from Bloomberg. And one of the projects that the Investigative Desk did was they got a, an article written in BMJ about hidden sources of funding. So, <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, we'll start. I, I think, Jerry, if anyone hasn't seen it, I really advise going on to the website, GFM website, and see him. Jerry did a pre record, 13 minutes long, where he went through some of the examples of, of this sort of behaviour that he's seen. Uh, and I really recommend you go and watch that if you haven't already. But do you want to start us off, Jerry, with, um, with your experiences and, and get us into the. Yes, I will. I'll give you a little bit of a, a flavour of, of, of this, and I'll be very careful because I, I realise I'm surrounded by vapours and I'm not, but uh, I've been kind of caught up in a whole lot of weird things over the last um, 10 years since I got involved in uh, tobacco harm reduction. So 2014 was the first year of GFN, but in the UK it was also the year when public health experts were rattled by the rise of vaping. 
And I, I couldn't really understand what was going on. It, it was kind of they couldn't cope with their expertise being challenged. Towards the end of 2014, John Ashton, who's president of the Faculty of Public Health, he let rip on vapors on Twitter, describing them as trolls, as onanists, and hinting that they had, quote, shadowy sponsors. He tweeted a female vapor, have you always been an anonymous C asterisk asterisk T? Have you always been an anonymous C asterisk asterisk T? So I thought, what, the, what on earth is going on? He was, as a result of that, suspended from his presidency of the Faculty of Public Health temporarily. This was bizarre because John Ashton was a leading figure in participatory public health in the time of AIDS and HIV, instituting needle exchange, outreach to sex workers, and so on. But this kind of hadn't come carried across to, uh, to, to, to safer nicotine products. The attacks ramped up later in 2014, a prominent UK vapor, uh, I was going to say a waitress, but I have to, uh, a restaurant server, um, with no experience of academic publishing, got a comment published in The Lancet. And this was fantastic, you know, really to get a comment in The Lancet. It, what an achievement. And she asked in that article, in that comment, that experts listen to the views of vapors and asked for a more inclusive debate. Her comment was met by miserable, a miserable sneering put down by Martin McKee, public health professor, Simon Chapman, a sociologist, and Mike Daub, a tobacco control activist. And coinciding with that, Chapman tweeted to quote, unctuous plea, tweeted this person, unctuous plea from a vaping activist who's cozy with trolls who post this stuff. She was up for it. She tweeted a wonderful. She tweeted wonderfully. I can't actually repeat what she's all of what she said here, um, but part of it was to quote murderous, dickless, evidence denying, public health bastards. <laughs> the whole tweet is more colourful, and you can. <laughs> so you know, vapors saw through this sort of pretentious, pompous public health posturing. Um, I come from a social science background and a kind of a, a public health social science background where engagement is crucial. Engagement in patients and populations are crucial and a founding principle of much of public health. So I couldn't really figure, you know, here what was going on. And in part, you know, can you imagine public health leaders criticizing, you know, saying cancer trolls or, you know, any other? You know, it just wouldn't happen. So there's something really peculiar, and we need to kind of unpick that. But in part, it's a struggle for ownership. Uh, and when these public health leaders, these public health activists and tobacco control activists were challenged, they were discombobulated. It's a word I've been wanting to use for a long time. And they didn't understand nicotine consumers as potential allies. And that's been the big sad thing about this. It's the exclusion, exclusion of people who could really be allies in, uh, in, um, in a move away from smoking. Um, same year it happened to me at a, a, a smoking cessation conference. We put on a panel of vapors, wonderful session. Right at the beginning of it, a friend of mine was excluded from the session person was allowed to attend the conference, but our badges were color-coded. He was from a tobacco company, so he was, he was excluded from the session. It was a segregated conference, and I thought, what on earth is going on that you'd ban certain people from uh, sessions? And right at the end of the session, I was approached by Dr. Anna Gilmore from the University of Bath, and it wasn't an uh, interesting session, Jerry, blah, blah, blah. She said, you didn't declare a conflict of interest. Now, in by then 40, 45 years of research and going to conferences, nobody had ever said that to me, and it seemed a rather odd uh, entree. So, um, I'll expand on, I've probably gone over time already, have I? Well, <laughs> so, um, we can expand a little bit on that, but you know, there are people who want to police the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, want to police Article 5.3, which is meant to protect policy from the tobacco industry. But it's really become kind of a petty, paranoid, persecutory policing by tobacco control activists. 
and it's a process of delegitimizing, excluding, and so on. I'll just try to hurry this up a little bit because I, I, I'm pretty thick-skinned and this kind of, you know, doesn't matter to me too much to me. But what's really nasty is, uh, in, as part of this, is the academic onslaught on vapors. And there are two articles in particular, uh, one by Patanovanich and Glantz, which try to suggest that ECST, vaping is not a crime, um, was in league with PMI. And so what they do is they look at what ECST is saying, and in fact, they, I think they thought you were an organization rather than a very active individual <laughs> at that time. And they looked at what PMI was saying, and it's kind of a... Um, a pseudo-causal synchronism. It's kind of more astrology than science. ECSD is saying this, PMI is saying this, hence they are in bed together. And there was another similar article by uh, Lindsay Robertson at the time of the FCTC when vapors were uh, tweeting about the FCTC and others were including from PMI and they did a Twitter analysis and the, the Bath University press release announced vaping advocates critical of global health treaty linked to tobacco giant. But again, it's this kind of magical, you know, there's some magical fluid dynamic going on here that because one bunch of people are saying things and another bunch of people are saying things, they're, they're, they're somehow linked. So um, I, 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 I'll try and draw it to a close, but somehow along the way, tobacco control needs enemies. And, and it continues because many of you in the audience will have their, your own personal experience of, the, of this. But uh, uh, we, can, we can talk about how to address this and how to respond to this. But as I said a little bit earlier, the big, the big sad thing is that it cuts off dialogue and it cuts off engagement with people who should all be working together to bring about an end to smoking. Yeah, th thanks, Joe. I, I find it interesting that what, what you touched upon there, that, that consumers can be excluded from the debate simply because they are speaking in favour of products which would be beneficial to the tobacco industry. So, you know, we say we like vaping products and therefore we're bad because the tobacco industry are making them. Well, that doesn't give us much of a chance, does it, really? You know? um, I'd just like to say, by the way, I forgot to say at the start, um, if you're watching online, um, you can put your questions in. I've, I've got a screen here, I can see your questions. And I'd, I'd also like to point out that I noticed on social media that this panel attracted a bit of attention from some of our, our opposition. Um, so welcome to them if you're watching, and you're quite welcome to put your questions in as well, should you choose. Um, do you want to go on to you next, Constantino? Because you've had a quite... Um, well, as I mentioned, the, the Bloomberg um, the piece on you and BMJ. Yeah, yeah. after uh, an article written by Bloomberg for me, uh, at the time of a valley, which is a misnomer, as we know, saying that I'm um, uh, basically a soldier of the, of the tobacco industry. Why? Because I replicated studies and I rejected findings published from American universities that reported some outrageous results in terms of e-cigarette emissions that were completely out of their fantasy, and I knew that, and that's why I wanted to replicate the studies. Um, and we, in fact, had hurdles replicating the studies because the scientists who published the studies were not willing to um, share with us the kind of products that they used in order to get the same products and replicate the study. So imagine that you're a scientist and you ask a colleague that, please tell me what kind of products did you use because I want to replicate your study, and not receiving any response, you know, and accusing you for wanting to do what? Replication, which is the, the definition of science is replication. There is no science without being able to replicate the findings. Anyway, the article that you mentioned in BFJ is very interesting because it was not done by scientists, by, but by journalists who had contacted me uh, a few months before the article. And I explained to them that I have no conflict that I need to, uh, to, to um, uh, mention in any of my studies. Because, first of all, uh, they were talking about studies about nicotine smoking and COVID. So we never mentioned the word, the word uh, harm reduction, we never mentioned vaping, we never mentioned heated tobacco products, snus or anything else. We only discussed about nicotine replacement therapies in all, in all our papers. And of course, 
there was no conflict because when one uh, academic gets personally for himself funding from the foundation, you can't expect someone who just knows him or has been working with him in irrelevant non-funded projects to declare conflict just because he's working with him in other, in, in other areas. Anyway, the interesting thing was not only that these people were funded by Bloomberg and they failed to, to disclose their conflict of interest in the article. It's even more interesting that BMJ did not allow me to respond in their website. So whenever I submit the response, including documents that I received from a friend of, of Information Act request from the University of Bath, that those journalists were funded by Bloomberg through the University of Bath, and that there was a document mentioning that the journalists should not disclose to anyone that they received funding from Bloomberg, I was always getting a response from the BMJ lawyer who changed my uh, text to a way that it was not my response, but it was the lawyer's response. So after three failed attempts to respond uh, on the website of the BMJ, I had to go somewhere else to a, a preprint server to Chaos and write a 12-page response, which was not only you know, a personal response about an unprecedented ad hominem attack, but also presenting the, the fact that this is discouraging research. We were not talking about harm reduction, we we're not talking about smoking, we we're talking about finding what is in smoking that protects from COVID and whether there are any therapeutic pharmacological implications in that. And by having such a fearful attack, the industry never discussed about COVID and smoking. By attacking in that way towards scientists, they basically discouraged research on the subject. But they don't care. BMJ doesn't care. The journalists don't care. When I told BMJ that they have not disclosed their funding and they are supposed to play the ethical role of discussing about conflicts, they never changed anything. Anyway, uh, you need to um, be brave and you need to have the courage to withstand that because uh, tobacco harm reduction is mostly a political issue, unfortunately, and a, a very small part is science. And uh, what has been unprecedented is what Jerry mentioned, that the users are excluded, not only excluded, but they treat them in a totally disrespectful way, with irony, with uh, 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 saying that they have conflicts or they've been paid by someone to say that. And unfortunately, I think, uh, Jay, that it's the same story that happened initially with HIV and AIDS. And the same story that happened initially 30, 40 years ago with um, intravenous drug users. You know, uh, people involved in this research knew better than uh, the people who were suffering from the effects of such dependence. And yeah, people who have probably never seen any cigarette in their life knew better than those who were using these cigarettes every day. Uh, and they've been smoke free. You know, when I started doing the research in 2011, I admitted my total ignorance concerning what an e-cigarette is. And in order to understand what an e-cigarette is, I just knew that they existed, but I knew that nothing about them. I went online, I found an online forum of Greek vapors, and I brought them to the hospital with their devices to explain to me What's the new cigarette? Why are you using this device instead of something else? What's happening to you? How did you manage to quit smoking? And that's how I learned. I mean, for something that is new to us, we can't pretend that we were born knowledgeable. We have to ask people who know and who use this before we ever knew their existence. And that's the vapors. Yeah, that was my introduction to vaping as well. I went on to forums. Uh, and I remember ask, saying, look, I don't know anything about these things. Someone educate me. And a, a kind lady in Leeds sent me a big jiffy bag full of things with post-it notes on it saying, this goes here, this goes there, yeah. Um, so that was my first introduction. Um, you mentioned there, you know, users or consumers are not allowed to, uh, to be involved. So we'll get on to some consumers here. Asa, I, Asa do you want to tell us your experience? And, uh, with, with, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be, actually, it could be long, it could be short, but... Uh, 
First of all, you know, like uh, Jerry had stated, that uh, they try to tie us, especially to PMI, and uh, because you know our organization, our group, we we started by calling ourselves in secret, small Thailand ECST. Actually, that's not the first name we came up with. Uh, the first name was Smoke Harm Intervention Thailand, but once you put it into the... Yeah, okay, you get that one, right? It's, it's going to be difficult to put SHIT on my shirt. So anyway, so uh, the, the opposition, the, the doctors, so-called doctors, they said, like, see, see uh, this, guy is, uh, this, guy, this guy is receiving $80 million per year from PMI, and look at their names. ECST and Secret Smoke Thailand when translated into Thai, it's exactly the same as I quit ordinary smoking, which I just found out that was like, this was not even a, 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 a longer term for I cause. I cause is something else, but you know, they tried to pull in, so they said like ECST is equal to I cause. We're going like, we, we never even thought of that. Or I would have gone back to SHIT, you know, like so just to avoid out the confusion. <laughs> so anyway, um, I have to go back, like for some of you who were the last session that, you know, Dr. Fasa and Bernard, they were talking about uh, the mentality, the effect of nicotine. I would like to just take a moment to refer back on that. Uh, I have my seizure as my, you know, like... Uh, happened once in a while, you know, but, and I talked to a neurosurgeon and the doctor specialized, a specialist in the brain and everything. So I asked him what I can and cannot do. He said, like, first of all, from, from that moment that I went back last year, say like, avoid driving, hmm. riding motorcycle, hmm. I already sold my bike, uh, alcohol and smoking. So I pulled out my electronic cigarettes, they're like, oh, what about vaping? She said, as a doctor, she wouldn't recommend inhaling anything except pure air, but that is going to be impossible to do. Vaping, she said this, she said like, well, at least vaping is much better than go out on the street and inhaling all the smoke and the smoke and the carbon monoxide and everything. Uh, she said, vaping, there's no combustion in vaping. So yeah, go ahead and vape. It might also help you with your uh, nervous symptom and it could relieve and uh, just you know, make you relax more. You could maybe you could go to sleep and have a deeper sleep and things like that. So you know, just confirm to the, the, the session before this one, it's, it's 100, this is, this is me, I'm a consumer, and uh, I'm also a victim of, uh, somebody said I have, uh, what was it, Alzheimer's disease and, and Parkinson's, well, I don't, but I have uh, seizures, it happened like five times already in my lifetime, and the last one was in Munich, right after last year's GFN, I was too tired, dehydrated, and uh, no medication, and I passed out at the airport before going back to Bangkok. And uh, I woke up at the hospital and then went back, got a treatment at hospital in Bangkok, and a specialist said, like, go on vaping, it's, it's not gonna do you harm. Maybe it, it may even help. So, you know, that's, that's from a consumer point of view and from a patient who suffered uh, the brain thingy also, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting the um, the lack of knowledge of, of medical professionals in some cases. And uh, there was a, a Twitter thread I saw yesterday where someone an American was saying they'd spoken to a pulmon pulmonologist, and uh, and, he, and and she mentioned that she vapes, and he said, "No, you, you'd be better off smoking. It's, you know where you are with that." And it's, and if anything, that perception seems to be getting worse, doesn't it? Um, Nancy, you're long time. You've been around a long time, <laughs> like me. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? What I've seen, Whoa. what I have seen is that the negativity and the attacks have ramped up as the consumers have actually become more vocal. So I see it as action reaction. But the other thing I see, and I've said this before, is the more scared and the more threatened you're tobacco control people get, the nastier the attacks become. And as you have thick skin, like you were saying, 
But what that tells me, and this is something I tell advocates who get downtrodden or they get burnt out, the fact that they're attacking you means A, they're paying attention to you, and B, they have nothing better to, to attack on because they can't argue with the science. Hennage uses that argument all the time as well, okay? If they're paying attention to you, that means you're doing the right thing, okay? And you have to keep doing it, and you have to understand that people who do that, humans, you know, for the various reasons, especially in academia, that people find us a threat, if they lose their cool and they lose their professionalism, you've already won, okay? Not only have you won because you're healthier, because you've made the switch and you feel better and the clear x-rays like at ECST and all of that, but you've won because you've, they have nothing to counter you with. And that's kind of where I come from nowadays because of what I'm seeing. So the more angry they get and the more effluent that gets published and accusations and everything else, it's like, yeah, okay. It's almost like watching a dinosaur, the end of the dinosaurs, that they have nothing better to come at me with. Yeah, we're winning. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've often said the same. You know, it, uh, it's funny how that they skip the debate and just go straight for the smear. So it tends to suggest they really haven't got anything else, and and they don't want the debate. Um, which which was going to be my next comment. You know, well, what do they hope to achieve with this? Is it, Jerry? Is it just to silence the debate? Do they not want to have the debate? Uh, what do you think they're hoping to achieve with all this sort of puerile? <laughs> yeah, it's puerile. Yeah. Well, I think it started with a, a matter of ownership because public health, tobacco control, like to kind of invent things and invent policies and so on and so forth. This came from left field. So right at the beginning, uh, there's kind of a question of ownership. There wasn't something they'd invented. Mm -hmm. It was coming from somewhere else. Um, and uh, uh, that leaves you with nothing much else to do it except to express fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and so show um, so s suspicions. So I think that's kind of the initial thing, but then it gets kind of embedded in the psyche of tobacco control activists and their institutions, because it's not just John Ashton throwing something out one Saturday night after. It, it, it was described as the Saturday evening Merlot meltdown, to quote. It's not me. Um, it's not just throwing slang in things like that, but then it becomes institutionally embedded because uh, University of Bath, for example, has 20 million plus from Bloomberg to fund the Tobacco Tactics website, which in fact was also, and is, they are also funded by Cancer Research UK, which is bizarre, but there's huge funding coming from, from Bloomberg into the University of, of, of Bath. Um, there's funding that goes into the quote, stop, expose tobacco program, which is also linked between Bath and other institutions. So there is a, an institutional framework and psyche for this, which means it's kind of not easily going to go away. And it sort of has its own roller coaster and its own echo chamber. So yeah, why it happens, well, I think what happened initially was fear and uncertainty about what was going on, but then it becomes institutionalized and into a kind of a mentality of a, I call it like a psychopathology of tobacco control, but it, it's there in the psyche of many tobacco control activists and it doesn't seem to be diluting. Do you feel that there's a little bit of projection happening as well? You know, because they're um, accepting these funds from, like, say, Bloomberg or from a pharmaceutical company, and they turn around and automatically accuse us of doing the same thing, except <laughs> it's a tobacco company. Um, I don't think they see their receipt of funding as in any way a conflict of interest. You know, they see it as legitimate funding but for what they money. are doing. We're, yeah. If we're getting money, if we're getting money, they would rather have the money for themselves. That's what I'm saying. Is it? I, no, I don't think so. I think it, it, it's, you know... I don't think it's projection, but I think there is, you know, it's inter you know, Farsalina's talking about declarations of conflicts right. and, and so on and so forth. You know, if you're getting money from Bloomberg, you never say that there's a conflict of interest. It's just legitimate right. funder. So um, I don't think it's competition so much as just um, kind of embedded in the, in the, you know, it's what they do. You know, there's an industry with, you know, the, the team at, um, uh, at Bath with Andy Rowell, who was actually one time quite a good investigative journalist, but they, they have nothing else now to do except to sort of try to name and shame. You know, whole yeah. websites which are just dedicated to I naming know. and shaming. 
Well, well, I think that what they feel does not necessarily represent reality. It is definitely a conflict of interest when you're being paid to have a specific view right. by people who already have a specific view mm -hmm. and they ask you to move and support that view. And that's exactly what Bloomberg and several other sources, even the FDA and the NIH, if you look at um, w when they um, release uh, a statement asking for proposals for research and they are providing funding, yeah. they're always looking for the bad things. You know, they basically, uh, I wouldn't say not even indirectly, they directly mm -hmm. uh, guide you into looking for bad things in order to receive the funding. So, yeah. these people are people who are paid to solve a problem. You cannot be paid to solve the problem unless you create the problem. Exactly. And in in most cases concerning harm reduction, it's more a problem creation by them rather than a problem that really exists. Uh, and the more you exaggerate presenting the problem as something which is totally catastrophic, the more money you're going to get. But this is definitely a conflict because you're being paid for that. And you're being paid by people who have a specific predisposition and prejudice against this strategy. Of course, at the same time, yes, funding by the interest is also a conflict. But you know, conflicts of interests are there to be declared, not to become the criterion for exclusion. What is happening now is that, and it's not only among uh, activists, but it's also among scientists, is that the conflict of interest is being used for exclusion. And we are, uh, uh, there are scientists working in uh, the tobacco industry who are performing excellent research, and they are unable to publish the research because the journals refuse to review such papers. They refuse to even accept them to be peer reviewed. And I've seen, in papers that I have reviewed, I've seen um, um, uh, comments by other reviewers who are mainly focusing on the source of funding and not on the content yeah. of the scientific paper. Yeah. And that makes no sense. Yes, conflicts of interest need to be declared. Yes, you need to be cautious, but you need to judge the content. You need to judge the data, not simply the funding source. And that's going to be the beginning and the end of the review. Can, That's can not I, science. I, I, was, I was going to say on, on this, because um, you touch on this, yeah, uh, do, you, do, you, do you think they believe that their actions are promoting public health? They definitely believe that, yes, because uh, in my opinion they are so obsessed with being right. Uh, I mentioned last year in the Michael Russell oration, they behave as if uh, they are the only owners of the truth and owners of knowledge. That's how they behave. This is a, a, an egoism at a completely different level. Uh, they know better than the users. They know better than anyone. And that's why they are not willing to accept any criticism. They are not willing to accept and tolerate any different opinion. And that's why they do not engage into the, 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 deba the debate. And Jerry knows very well, I was also in the scientific committee of this uh, conference uh, in the first few years. We tried desperately to bring people to discuss openly here, to present their views mm -hmm. in the way they wanted, as, with as much time as they wanted. They didn't even respond to our attempts to invite them. So they, and I think this also, is uh, showing that their arguments are pretty weak. Because if your argument is strong, you would be glad to come to a hostile, let's call it, environment and present your views. I would be glad to go to an environment where everyone else is an anti-THR activist, and I know that they're going to attack me. I would love that. That would be fascinating. <laughs> but they don't think of the same way, and that's why they don't want to come here. And I'm sure they won't be attacked. But they will be asked questions that they don't want to answer, or they cannot answer. And, and especially with consumers. I mean, you know, consumers, 
um, I think there was a study done last year that said that the total amount of funding for consumers in the, in, in the whole world was about $130,000. And a lot of that was probably their own money. Um, and yet consumers aren't allowed to go to these events and, and ask questions. So why do they fear debate? I'll ask you two. What, why do yeah, you think uh, they fear let, the debate? Let me, let me first go back to about the conflict of interest and plus what Jerry had said at the beginning, you know, that we, we got like Patana, uh, I can't remember, her last name is too long, but uh, Rundi is her first name. Anyway, and uh, all, all this, everything combined. Let, let me say, let me ask all of you, you know, especially those watching at home and the doctors and the tobacco control people say like, okay, if you want to discuss conflict of interest, Let's take a look, for example, I'm not going to look for, I'm not going to look at the United States or Canada or so South Africa and America or even in Europe, but in Asia and Asia Pacific. Think about this, the delegates that will be going to COP10 or the delegates that had gone to COP1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 or whatever, well, not 9. Um, what about their conflicts of interest? Take Thailand, for example. The fundings are from Syntax. Isn't that almost directly from tobacco sales? Think about it for a minute. Uh, shouldn't representative of each country be someone in the health department, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Public Health, or at least be known to the people whom they represent in Thailand, even until now, or every year, except one year in India. We don't even know who represents us. And it's those tobacco control people who got 100% of their incomes from the syntax, meaning from tobacco and alcohol. One year in India, Many of you would remember that. Delegates from Thailand went in and submitted like a, 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 a plea saying like, every country in the world should ban vaping like Thailand just did. And the delegates from United, uh, the United Kingdom said like, where's your proof? Well, we don't really have any proof, but since we are banning cigarettes, this is electronic cigarettes, so it should also be banned. So that's the only answer that they could come up with. Uh, and then they came back and then came back to Thailand and said like, hey, listen, you know, we pronounced, we had announced that we are the one of the first country who ever banned vaping and, you know, we will be success. And I, I was sitting at home and heard their, their statement. And I was like, that's not what I heard. Because, you know, we know where we are within this, and then we heard, like, no, I heard something else, but, you know, their voices are strong. They have, they control the medias and whatnot. So it was like, we were like, is this who we're fighting with? Is this a battle, like, a never-ending battle, like, there's no chance of winning? We started off with, like, just, just me and then a few people, and right now we have, like, 100,000 members for ECST members and followers. And uh, so I just like to just kind of like shout out, say like, you know, don't think that your only vo you, your voice alone wouldn't make a difference. It would, it would, we have done it. But you know, to talk about the conflict of interest, why don't they declare that kind of conflict of interest? Uh, another issue is that you're talking about COP meetings and COP meetings have one major characteristic, complete lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, exclusion. Yep. For example, consumers cannot go to any COP meetings. Journalists have been thrown out of the meetings. Yep. They're doing meetings behind closed doors. They are supposed to work for public health, so for the people, but they don't accept the people. They only accept selected uh, scientists and uh, uh, people and activists who support their views. And one of the criterion to, of going there is what have you expressed as your opinion on the subject? And that's basically the way that they accept people going there. So uh, uh, what we should be discussing is the complete lack of transparency of, of the WHO. Yeah. Well, 
Well, yeah, and I mean, and in a lot of governments, I mean, we, we've seen it in New Zealand and in a couple other countries. You know, 5.3, Article 5.3, it was put in place to protect um, government officials from being corrupted by money from big tobacco companies. Right. They are now using that in some places to refuse to engage with consumers. A complete, you know, hijack of that concept. But yet, as ASA said, they're more than willing to accept the tobacco excise that they collect from the people who pay it for the people who smoke. So they are too accepting, you know, tobacco money. But that's okay because that's the money that they need because, you know, the, the sin tax, okay, they need that for their research, they need that for this, they need that for that. It's so far removed. But they're, they're, that's what I came, meant by projection. They're accusing us of doing something that they're already doing. Let me ask all of the panel just a, a, a sort of mischievous question. I'll start with you, Jerry. Um, is the tobacco control community a wild west? <laughs> does, it need, does it need regulation? Um, it does need regulation, but I can't see where that would come from. You know, it. <sighs> It amazes me that there are journals that publish rubbish. You know, I was a journal editor for 20 years, and the, the stuff I see, particularly in BMJ tobacco control, is just awful. You know, the, the, the paper that we, you know, in which ECST was um, criticized, you know, I did a long critique of that and sent it to the BMJ. In fact, the critique was probably longer than the paper because as well as the unfounded accusation that you were working hand in glove with PMI, it was just methodologically pathetic you know, and a lot of it is so uh, there's not as we, you know we've discussed this before there's not a regulatory system within um, within publishing which will stop this there's also not a peer regulatory uh, aspect uh, 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 there could be peer regulation but it, it surprised me that in the UK for example many of the good people in tobacco control you know in the, the people doing good work on or, or, on e-cigarettes and other things and making sensible statements, they're actually all linked in with the University of Bath. You know, they have these shared consortia for research and for public health intervention. None of them, none of them has ever spoken up about the antics at the University of Bath. I mean, they ought to be shamed, in, they ought to, they ought to be shamed into saying something and not participating. But, you know, it doesn't happen. People don't want to rock the, the boat. Um, you know, you can complain. Um, we complained to the BMJ about that article, and eventually it went all through their legal, blah, blah, blah. And they actually altered the article. They didn't publish a correction. They pulled the original article and printed a slightly different new article, which, again, not what you do in publishing. You actually say what, what's wrong. So there's a small triumph there. Um, there was another one with the Lindsay Robertson one and the, 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 uh, the, the nasty thing about the analysing the tweets around COP8 from um, consumer organisations is that it, they actually named organisations in their presentations and in the paper. Now many of these organisations are just one or two people. So if you name an organisation, you're naming someone who might be harmed by that publication. So that was taken up with the University of Bath Ethics Committee. Uh, and I, I got a lot of the ethical, you know, the, the, the submission about the study and all the rest of it. And all the submissions were about protecting the staff from vapors and, uh, and uh, uh, from attacks. And nothing, no consideration at all that by publishing, you know, you've got deductive disclosure. If you mention a particular small vaping organization, which we know might be just one or two people uh, in a particular country, you've got deductive disclosure. So there's a real risk to people, you know, I, I, there's no risk to me because I'm at the end of my career, but you know, there's risk to people's careers and their livelihoods and you know, real physical risk in some countries by being named in, in such a way. And the, the University of Bath Ethics Committee just you know, didn't get that. So there's a, there is a failure of, 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 of self-regulation and, and regulation. I, mean, I don't know, you know, just come back to the UK academics, is it that they don't want to rock the boat or... Um, or uh, you know, are they afraid of guilt by association? And you'll notice a lot of them don't come to GFN anymore. You know, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, there are people who are banned from coming to GFN. Uh -huh. And there's somebody who's got a contract down the line from what was Public Health England 
who was told that if they wanted to continue their contract, they would have to cease any conversation with me and not come to GFN. So there's a whole lot of thing that goes on behind the, the scenes here, which is very hard to sort of expose and to sort of let... A, a lot of the world depends on people being nice to each other <laughs> and not, being, not doing all the... Well, you know, it's not like, just it's not just Warsaw. It's not just GFN. Um, I've heard of people yeah. who've been told they're not even allowed to go to Warsaw in June. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, but, yeah, I know. Well, uh, uh, and uh, just to give a plug for GFN, I mean, you know, you would love GFN, but you know, we 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 welcome everybody. But this 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 ban in this exclusion, there are conferences which are organised you know, uh, around smoking, uh, and the conferences that. Bath University, events Bath University is involved in, which ban you from participation if you have any link to the tobacco industry to the fourth degree of consanguinity. Now, look that up. That's great, great, great grandparents. Or going forward, it'd be my great, great, great grandchildren who'd be forever barred from going to anything like this. It, it's bonkers. It, it's, it's a stricter definition than the Nazi definition of, of being a Jew. It's just, you know, bloodline or by marriage for several generations bans you. And I must give you a little aside. I'm going on a little bit. I, I, they even do this with online events. You know, you have to declare that you're not whatever. Um, and so I filled in one of these things and I said, well, I'm not sure. I no, but didn't use my name. I used somebody else's. I made up a name to sign on to this event. So I said, I'm not sure, but I think that going back, and the family history is that my, um, my, 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 my great, great, great grandfather was a plantation manager doing the, uh, tobacco plantation manager during the time of slavery. <laughs> but they, they let that pass. So, <laughs> you know, part of it, you have to be humorous about this and you have to use ridicule, you know, and uh, most harm reductionists are fun people and uh, a lot of people we're talking about I don't think are fun people. So that, you know, the, the, yeah, yeah, okay, I made the well, point. Uh, uh, in fact, <laughs> <laughs> I would disagree with the statement that the tobacco control is uh, a sort of a wild west uh, kind of situation. In my opinion, it's the exact opposite. They are extremely well organized very homogeneous in the way they behave, in the type of uh, uh, opinions they express and where they express them, and they are excellent in creating consensus, in quotes, by exclusion. Yeah. So everyone agrees with our views because we know who we are inviting and we know what these people are thinking and are saying, so we create a consensus among ourselves by excluding everyone else. The big problem is that, unfortunately for them, we are not simply outliers. There are a lot of people who support harm reduction because it makes sense, because harm reduction uh, in tobacco is not very different from harm reduction even in our daily lives and in other issues of public health. And it has been accepted even by those people who behave in a pretty fanatical way against tobacco harm reduction. And just because Harm reduction is not only about smoking, and it's nothing new. It's something that we have applied in our daily lives for years. That's why it's very hard for them to achieve their goals. But they're not Wild West. They are very well organized. They have a consistent kind of behavior, um, consistent ad hominem attacks against scientists, against consumers, against anyone with a different view. Uh, and that's the big problem we are facing. They are well organized and they are well funding t funded too. Can I, can I ask you a question, Constantine? What, you're a scientist. What, what's the effect on science and public health of excluding research, excluding researchers, uh, not listening to the other, other side? Well, it, it, it must it, surely be harmful. You know, uh, science is uh, the art of disagreement, you know. That's how science progresses. And you can't have science without a debate. And debate is not about agreeing, of course. It's always about disagreeing. And that has been a sort of a failure of GFN, which is not because of GFN and the way it's organized, but because of their denial to engage into a debate. This is something that we tried to implement since the first year, 2014. We failed, but it was not our failure. It was their denial to come and engage into the debate. So that's a big hurdle for science. And this is 
confusing for regulators. It is very confusing for consumers. And that's why we end up having still 1.1 billion smokers globally. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, I want to ask you, what should advocates do? How should we respond to all this? How should we behave? Um, yeah, that's <laughs> And remember, you're in public. When they're in public, yeah. Um, one of the things that I, th that I do say to advocates who ask me, you know, what do I do? If somebody is attacking you, for example, you know, I've gotten attacked by our friend Tahir. <clears throat> and uh, if you're out there, hello. And, you know, I refuse to engage with him. Just I, I, in my mind, when somebody is attacking me, that's a toddler having a tantrum. And what do you do when a toddler has a tantrum? You don't engage. Let them flip out and then get back to it. You have to take the high road because when I go out there and people are coming at me, I'm like, it's not just about me. I represent everyone, not just in Asia Pacific, not just in New Zealand, but I'm a consumer advocate. And as a consumer advocate, if I do something stupid, it's going to make all of us look bad, and I don't want to do that. Um, staying focused, not allowing yourself to be distracted by the diversionary tactics, because that's a big thing. Divide and conquer is a very, very big thing. They want to get you riled up. They want you to go off, off message. They want to say, aha, see? Um, it takes, it's taken me years not to freak out publicly. I mean, when I'm not online, there's things that are said in my house in multiple languages that wouldn't be fit for anybody. But you know, it, I realize that what I'm doing, I'm representing not just me, but I'm representing you, and you, and you. And you have to stay focused, and you have to stay on message. And it can be very hard, but with practice, you can do that. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes. so. Um we can go for some questions. I've got a question here that we can start with. Uh, can I just say, um, although I know many of you in the audience have probably got um, tales of your own examples of exclusions, um, although you know, uh, your anecdotes might be very interesting, um, can we have actual questions rather than, we don't want to have just a, a long, impotent whinge about this subject. You know, come up with ideas of what we can do, you know, how we can move forward and, and make things better, perhaps. I don't know, it's up to you, but we'll come to them soon. I've got a question here on the Q, uh, for, online from Fig, Fig Ramsey. In a recent interview, Clive Bates expressed the view that tobacco control often sees the vapour industry as a predator and its customers as gullible victims who have been trapped by the industry. How do you believe this perception influences tobacco control strategies and initiatives, particularly in relation to harm reduction alternatives like vaping? And what steps can be taken to foster a more empathetic and nuanced approach that considers the potential benefits and risks associated with these alternative products? Who wants to take that okay, one? Fig. Um, yeah. That's... Hi, Fig. Um, you know, one of the things that can, you and I have actually had this discussion. Fig and I have had this discussion. And one of the things that I find extremely frustrating is the, the, the complicity of the media in taking things and twisting. twisting them to the point that people go from using something safer and then going back to the thing that will probably hurt them, okay? And it, it seems like people accept that. And a lot of the independent vape shop owners have been put through so much mm. and being attacked. I mean, as consumers, we get attacked, but they get attacked as well, okay? And the people that get harmed are the people that don't have those choices and don't have those options. And to me, it's not just tobacco control. It's the media. And the way to deal with that, again, remember, the people that are in, that are in tobacco control, the people in the government, they work for you. You're the voter, OK? They work for you. Richard wants to ask something. So keep that in mind. Yeah, there's some microphones around you. Uh, Richard has got his hand up. And then Norbert. Thank you. Uh, Richard Pruin from uh, Safer Nicotine Wiki. How should we actually approach trying to reach the people that we're actually trying to save, which is the smoker? Can we, is there a way we can bypass the, the anti-crowd? Can we actually work around them? Is that a possibility? Thank you. In New Zealand, what we did is we had, there was a group of three of us or four of us, Matawa was involved in this before we actually organized, but we would have meetups and people would come up to us and ask us, what are you guys doing? And we'd 
kind of mentor them and help them to switch, okay? We can't do that anymore in New Zealand. But grassroots, if you see somebody who's smoking, walk up to them with your vape, start vaping next to them, start the conversation. That's how we did it. Yeah, there was lots of that in the early days in the UK, but that seems to have kind of faded out of... Is there anything new that we should perhaps think about? I think we go back to basics. Yeah, I agree also, because initially it was something new. There was more motivation by the consumers. Now motivation has weaned off, and that's, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I fully agree that we need to go back to basics. The consumer organizations have a huge role to play. Unfortunately, they are seriously underfunded, and it's very hard for them to fund themselves and do it because they don't have any financial interest or they don't have any profits that they can invest into uh, such an advocacy. But vape shops and consumers did that initially, and I think that they should take this role seriously again uh, and um, go back to basics. Okay, uh, Norbert had his hand up, and, and then Alex uh, after that. Yeah. And, and then Roberto, yeah. Norbert Zeller von Schmidt, German Consumers Organization, IGED. Uh, I have one tidbit uh, from the tobacco controls that they really like to brag about, uh, that's the scream test. So every time uh, they get opposition, they feel confirmed that they are doing the right thing. But then they take it a step further and they claim that every opposition they get is a sign that the, the, the source of the opposition is totally invalid and part of the conspiracy against them. And the uh, funny thing is how they scream when we hit them where they uh, don't uh, want to apologize us when we send uh, when we show them data and science and they scream big tobacco big tobacco big tobacco choose your battles and choose who you're going to fight with if you can't talk to someone about that and they don't want to accept it what you do is you circumvent and you go around so you go and talk to an MP or someone like that you don't have to argue with them go around it Yeah, I'll just, I, 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 I'll ask you this, um, as Norbert was saying, yeah. the scream test. Sh you know, should, should we be happy that they're screaming? You know, are we hitting them where it hurts? What do you think? Well, you know, like when, when like Norbert has said, you know, we, we, one of the things that we've always faced with is like, uh, if like a neutral ground or neutral zone wants to hold like a debate or like a seminar or things like this, uh, one of the excuses that the tobacco control people will come out and say that, first of all, you know, they don't want to attend with any affiliation with big tobacco. And second, you know, the, the, the second one was that they don't want to meet with the violent people. You know, we, we are violent. They, they, they were saying like, oh, we don't want to go and fight with all those violent people, meaning us, you know, I'm kind of like, when did we ever become, you know, we are so peaceful. I mean, you guys are like, hmm. But, you know, like that, that's, that's how they look at us and that, that's the, the, the reason they care for not showing up. Plus, uh, about f six years ago, there, there's going to be a big conference similar to GFN in Bangkok. And uh, there had been responses from a few doctors, specialists in the fields, especially those who are really doctors and uh, they got scolded and from the mafia, the tobacco control people, uh, even up to the point that, you know, these few doctors who already said like, okay, we'll go, we'll join you. Uh, they had been called from this, this doctor, the boss of uh, Patanapodins, and um, I said like, well, if you want to go, you better be really careful because your career might go haywire and it could end up in HEWL and things like that. So they have been like, it's even more than mafia and things like that. Yeah. 
Uh, Alex. Thank you. Uh, Alex Wardak, Australia. My question is to anyone on the panel who wishes to respond. And I want to take up the point that uh, Konstantinos made, which I thoroughly agree with, that the biggest cost we're facing uh, with the behaviour of our opponents uh, is the lack of a debate. Uh, and really what this means is that we've now got, uh, on one side, we've got a closed system and the feedback loop of correction has been permanently removed. And that's very, very unhealthy. Uh, their response to this is to say that uh, th this issue is settled and closed and finished and uh, any discussion on it is frivolous and a waste of time. Now, um, we do say in science, as Roberto said the other day, uh, that uh, there are no settled scientific questions in science. That's sort of true, but it's not really true uh, in a practical sense. Uh, we've stopped debating whether the Earth rotates around the sun or the sun rotates around the Earth, and none of us would want to engage in a debate on that in 2023. So the question is, how do we decide which questions are indeed frivolous and a waste of time debating, and how do we decide which questions are legitimate and should be open for debate? And if we could, I appreciate this is a difficult question to throw at you now, but if we could come up with some criteria now or in the future, I think it would help us maybe to move forward. Thank you. Do you want to start on that one, Jerry? Oh, well, I think the whole subject um, of uh, harm reduction is a question that we need to address. Uh, uh, of course, I fully agree with you. They think that the, the, the debate has been settled, that we know everything that uh, the, there is to know and that there is only one conclusion that's undisputable. But it's not like that. Uh, harm reduction has worked. It has been accepted after, after long battles, and you know that yourself also, in other fields. It has been universally accepted everywhere. What's the difference with, har with tobacco harm reduction? They're going to say it's the big tobacco industry involvement. They're going to say a lot of things. Then you should move and uh, bring us examples of success stories of countries where harm reduction was endorsed and examples of success stories where harm reduction was banned for tobacco. Sweden is the biggest success story in the world, basically the only smoke-free country. And it was a country which adopted, I mean, not in reality advertised by the authorities, but it was a country that achieved the smoke-free status by using harm reduction for decades, not, for now, not recently. So where is the, another country with such, so successful where harm reduction was excluded. You can't find examples. Anyway, I think that the whole issue of harm reduction is debatable. You can't have, you know, specific points that uh, should not be debated or are already resolved and there is nothing we can say because it's a public health issue where you should balance potential benefits with potential risks. And everything is in creating a balanced regulation. Regulation is, of course, definitely needed. Uh, there is no doubt. I don't, don't think anyone disagrees with that. But we are missing the balance because the tobacco control movement, the vast majority of them, are uh, playing in their own field. They have the, uh, uh, they have the holy money <laughs> from Bloomberg and from, from government organizations. And they influence regulators and politicians and big organizations like the WHO, which, let's be honest, for some, uh, for many countries, WHO is like a religion. They will accept, with no questions asked, anything they say. And the WHO is also an organization who should be held accountable for excluding people from the debate and from not engaging in any type of a debate. You know, I was once in the Philippine Senate, and the a representative of WHO who was invited to speak didn't know that I would be there. And she was terrified because I was there. She was terrified. She wanted to be alone, with no position, with no different opinion, and just present their own views. And they created so much confusion among the senators, 
It was unbelievable. She was asked by a, a senator yeah. what's happening with nicotine and whether it's toxic or not. The, the, the WHO representative responded with uh, 10 minutes debate about nothing. And when she finished, I asked the senator, so tell me what was your conclusion from what you heard? And the senator said, I, I realized that nicotine is a carcinogen. And she never even mentioned the word carcinogen, but they, are, they were so confusing in their responses. They didn't want to present facts. They wanted to create confusion. And when you create confusion, you create fear, and the response to fear is restrictions and bans. And that's what they're doing. But that's not scientific. That's not ethical. There, there was an industry in the past that used to sow a lot of confusion and doubt. Um, I can't remember what industry that was. <laughs> so you've, they're, they're acting the same way. Uh, Jerry, you were going to say something. Uh, I'll try to be brief because there's still a lot of questions. I, it, 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 we can learn a lot about the, the structure of scientific revolutions, the shift from one paradigm to another paradigm, but we also got to remember that it's not just about the questions and the facts and the science, but how those paradigms are so tied up with worldviews, belief in God, belief in certain values and all the rest of it. And I think that's the big struggle here. It's not just agreeing questions and what the evidence might be to look at those um, questions, but you're dealing with something that's really passionate and deeply held within people. I mean, I've been thinking through this. I mean, you know, can we look at South Africa and Northern Ireland? You know, is there a reconciliation process? Um, can people agree on trying to? But I, I, I don't think there's anywhere near that yet, because, uh, as it were, the other side don't want a peace and reconciliation. So how you get to that starting point is a, a big issue. Roberto, you had a question. Uh, wait for the microphone. The microphone. Ah, thank you. A uh, very simple question: um, What? How can we react to moral panics? This is important because we are sort of stable and disagreements and exclusion, all these things. But suddenly, bang! A, a moral panic, and moral panics are like fire. They, they, they start, and uh, it is difficult to reply. Shall you follow the moral panic, or shall you simply say no and, 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 con and confront people? I would like, it, it's important. We are in, in this type of fires. What, what would you say about that? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll answer that. Uh, first of all, let me go back to the, first, uh, the, the, the question before this one, and plus all the science there, I, because I was fortunate enough to watch your session, and science is always changing with, you know, with, with, with challenges. Uh, back to the question about b before moral panic. Uh, when you go out, like the plan in the, for the future, uh, what I would like to say is that you got to know your audience, right? And this will also including the, the moral panic. You have to know your audience. You know, you already know your topic, your session. Yes, was it yesterday the workshop. You know, like we had come up with vaping safe life for example, and then you know, you know your audience who you're gonna talk, and mainly you have to know that what kind of topic or, or what at that moment at that moment in time what are they interested in. And then you push harm reduction into whatever is their interest. So you, you're going to pull their interest in the first, like, for example, you know, like this is June. So it's Pride Month, so we might do something with that. And then how can we play along with that? And that will also go with, like, the, the moral panic. It's, it's the same, same uh, answer to that question, is that know your audience, know how to talk with them, know their minds, you know, like that. When when you when someone's gonna throw in is is like in is of fables, you know the, uh, the coconut fell down and the, that rabbit just ran all over the forest, and saying the world is coming to an end. So you have to calm people down for the moral panic and then just hit them with the truth, but don't just go wham. This is the truth. And they're like no 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 no. But don't be so persistent. Just like go calmly, slowly, and just like try to educate them, make them understand, and then like for, for myself, what I would do is I would use myself for an example, how I've been smoking and you know what happened to my health before and after I quit and how I could quit and just 
you know, when you speak from your own personal view, you get more attention, like, hey, this guy is talking because he's been through it. You know, I have climbed that Everest mountain. Oh, what was it like, how's the weather up there? Instead of saying like, oh, I know a guy who knows a guy who had climbed the mountain, so which is going to be different. So, I, I, yeah, they use the children. But you know what? The thing is, um, we as advocates, one of our big jobs is to humanize this and do what Asa is saying about you know our stories. When they talk about the children, I mean, it's up. I think. If the scientists give us the information, we can present that information to people like, you know, you've done it too. Like we say, hey, we agree. Yeah, you know, we agree, but we don't want kids vaping. However, let's look at this, you know, realistically. Um, we have to humanize it. On the consumer side, that's on us. Yeah. Well, the, the big problem, uh, Roberto, is that um, it's the scientists of the tobacco control movement who are pretty emotional and use emotion and <laughs> panic uh, attacks in a moralistic way and uh, try to present it as, as uh, unethical. It's the kids. It's, it's a disaster. What's the ideal situation that no one uses anything, no one gets any harm from anything? And I, I agree that consumers are the only ones who can respond in an emotional way uh, as uh, Nancy both, both said, basically. Uh, in our case, in terms of science, we can only respond with data. And we will try to um, bring the discussion back to uh, a discussion about evidence and data rather than a discussion about emotions and fear. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm sorry, Bengt um, and Helen. If you want to come up and ask your questions afterwards, we, we have to wrap up. We're out of time. But thanks, thanks everyone, uh, for, for listening. And, and if you'd just put your hands together for the panel, Asa, Nancy, Jerry, and Constantina.
Hello, I'm David McIntosh and welcome to this, the final commentary session um, from GFN 2023. I'm delighted to be joined by two colleagues, uh, Sharena Chakona Lidza <laughs> uh, from Georgia, who has a background of working to improve health across a, a range of topics and communities, and Dr. Sud Padwadan from UK and India, who's got a fascinating background in both the pharmaceutical and the tobacco industry, and it would be fair to say is someone who could be described as a stalwart of GFN. Um, so here we are. Um, we've had four days of GFN. Uh, I make it something like eight workshops, two symposia, four panels, two keynotes, two plenary sessions, and we still have one more to go. Um, and I'm now going to ask, um, and I think I'll start with Sharena, about... <laughs> What's been your impression? What's been your favourite session so far? What theme that's emerged has particularly grabbed your attention? Yeah, thank you, David, uh, for inviting me here, first of all. Uh, there were a lot of uh, interesting se sessions, uh, but one of my favourites were the uh, session uh, from where uh, there were countries involved, uh, including my country, from Central Asia. And uh, the same background as my country. I mean, uh, we do not like talking about this, but it's our uh, Soviet past, mm. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have we all have the same background. And it was something new for me, and it was more interesting for me, more understandable for me, uh, because um, it is uh, something different. Our experience is quite different from experience of, for example, UK. Uh, I, I know that uh, we, are, um, we are on the same way and will come mm, to the same uh, point at one, one day, but I don't know when. Uh, so it was very interesting for me, but uh, mostly uh, if we assess the sessions, uh, uh, it uh, depends on our background always. <laughs> so, and I want to mention last year because it was first, my first time last year. So, and uh, first time it was different, you know, it was, I was so shocked. <laughs> that's the only thing I could concentrate. Uh, that, oh, there are so many good speakers and they, they are so knowledgeable. I want them in my country. I want doctors to to hear them in my country. And I think uh, after hello, the mm. only thing I was telling them, can you help me <laughs> at least online and talk <laughs> with the doctors in my country? And uh, some of them helped really. So at this year, it was different. <laughs> uh, I, I was just listening more and uh, I understood. I have understood more, yes. That's, that, that, that's, that's a difference. <laughs> I mean, that's really wonderful. And I think <laughs> one of the things uh, is noticeable this year is that again we have people who've come from countries and backgrounds that we haven't had at GFN before mm -hmm. and I hope they all uh, have as a positive experience <laughs> as you've just described. Yeah. Sud, what's been your sort of highlight favourite element of GFN 2023? Uh, do I, does it have to be one and the question is rather uh, <laughs> because I, I have just too many of them, it, sorry. If it was <laughs> anyone other than you, I'd ask them to ration themselves, but in your case, you're, you're allowed more than one. Thank you so much. That really helps because, look, I mean, this is my 10th GFN, so I've attended, I'm very <laughs> proud to have attended all the GFNs and have been, uh, but the one thing is interesting that every GFN has only been better and better and bigger and better. Mm -hmm. And uh, I say that not to make you happy, but because I mean it, I have been through all of them. And I think uh, what really strikes me is the evolution of the debate, but also the narrative that evolves out of that is, is phenomenal. And that also means that uh, more people are understanding what this is about. There are new stakeholders who come to this. Uh, well, that's a, okay, so I'm digressing into a rather mm -hmm. philosophical answer. Favorite session, well, one workshop I really loved purely for how it was conducted was a workshop by Maruwa, uh, Maruwa Glover. Uh, and, and the rest of the team that supported her because it was truly a workshop. They actually were flip charts and stuff, so rather old-fashioned <laughs> but very, very innovative because it really got people to get involved in the process and they've actually printed out something as a result of that workshop, which is good to see because you can always have a good chit-chat yeah. about stuff 
and then forget it. But now there is a printout which says, look, this is what we have come up with. Yes. And hopefully that becomes a kind of uh, a stimulant for future work. So that's one workshop I can uh, say was my favorite. <coughs> Another one slightly different, but important because historically, to my knowledge, uh, my memory, uh, GFN has not dealt with medicinal licensing of reduced risk products. So uh, this workshop that you know, Ian Fearon, Jazz Alwalia, and a whole bunch of very smart people mm -hmm. were talking about how and what and whether and, and so on about medical licensing of e-cigarettes, pouches. I think that created a lot of, generated a lot of interest and ideas and, and food for thought. And if one final workshop I can comment on <laughs> was obviously the one on LMICs, low middle income countries. And despite the fact that I was chairing it, I think the idea was to really raise the profile of those 80% of the world's consumers of risky tobacco products and at least remind the audiences that, hey, you know what? Let's not forget who we are doing this for as well. I think that's a really uh, interesting point to end on. And I think your session, which was excellent, Thank obviously you. I have to say that, but it, it, it was. But we, we have, we've had a couple of themes that have come through other sessions looking at countries that are in danger of being left behind, uh, as well as communities um, that have been left behind, where smoking rates in, in, in some places are astonishing. You know, in some countries where it's still 50%, but even within you know, developed countries like the UK, which people say is a great model, we still have some groups within our population with smoking rates at 80% or higher. Yeah. Um, thinking of homeless, rough sleepers, people who are going into prison. And I've very much enjoyed that focus, but it's been very helped as well by a greater medical input this year across an, a number of areas. Which brings me to another question to both of you, is how do we, how do we continue this good work of bringing in more people, more groups, and indeed more countries, so that we can broaden it out? And mm. I'm going to start with you again, because you look like you have an idea about <laughs> to oh, burst forth. Uh, well, I, I would have loved for Sharina to also comment on that, because I have a uh -huh. ton of ideas, and all uh, have evolved over the years in terms of what are the priority populations and countries that we need to target. Uh, one common theme that uh, we have found over the last decade almost is uh, the lack of understanding of nicotine. And this might sound like a broken record and you might think, oh, so it goes again. But honestly, the lack of understanding of what nicotine is vis-a-vis -vis the product format in which it is sold, which is mostly mm -hmm. combustible cigarettes and oral tobacco products in South Asia and so on, mm -hmm. that nicotine has to be clearly understood as a separate an identity of itself. Currently it is not. So healthcare practitioners, for example, on an average 80% of the doctors around the world, not just in specific countries, around the world, wrongly believe that nicotine in tobacco products causes cancer. Now think of it, this is the community of experts and specialists who are expected to be advising yeah, their patients, right. one would call them consumers, but they are effectively coming as a patient to a doctor or a dentist. And the doctor is, 80% of the doctors saying, yeah, but mm -hmm. just quit, yeah? Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to tell you yeah. how much nicotine you should be consuming uh, in a safer nicotine replacement form that allows you to get off your risky habit for good in a sustainable way. So this is a big barrier. And I think uh, that's where the work has to kind of proceed, where we identify that this is an issue and mm -hmm. then systematically go and use existing evidence, which is the WHO, for example. The World Health Organization says that uh, and, and has nicotine replacement therapy as a part of a model essential medicines list. Many countries have adopted it in their national medis medicines list, but the access to these products is pretty much zero. Uh, yeah, that's right. Just to sort of reinforce the point you're mm. making there, you know, we did mm. hear from one of the speakers from Vietnam mm -hmm. where the medical profession do not trust nicotine replacement therapy because they perceive nicotine as being an incredibly dangerous substance in and yeah. of itself. So that kind of yeah. world view of nicotine can have a very negative impact even when we're looking at something like NRT. Absolutely. Sure. I, I should continue about nicotine because it's a huge problem in my, in my country. The first time when I really got interested into the subject was when we conducted study among doctors uh, and awareness about nicotine and about uh, alternative products is so low uh, that uh, uh, the only thing that doctors can advise any smoker is just quit, nothing more. Or uh, in most cases, as they do not know, they just say that they are more dangerous, don't switch to alternative products, for example. And as for replacement therapy, it was a shock for me. 
I thought uh, if uh, anything is written in the guideline, so it is on place and it's implemented. And I found out that none of the doctors, I was the only one who read this guideline. So, and no, none of the doctors were using uh, this replacement therapy in, in my country. There is no replacement therapy in my country. Yeah, I yeah <laughs> and, and it's awful. So, but uh, as for GFN, <laughs> so my suggestion is so what, what, what I would like to see next year, for example, I would like uh, more um, working groups or something like this. So to combine groups of uh, uh, people with similar background or countries with similar background. And uh, together we can just uh, create something some uh, activities, plans, I don't know, some uh, documents uh, which can be helpful in our countries uh, and for our future planning. I think uh, it, will, it will be more practical thing and it will be very helpful, especially in countries like mine where the awareness level is so low and uh, also the influence of WH, uh, uh, the, the WHO is so high <laughs> and uh, it's dangerous. Uh, because uh, I am sure it will change, mm. but uh, we want to accelerate the process. Yeah. May I comment on that? Of course. Yeah. I, I'm, I just want to sort of, I completely agree. I think it's, uh, and I love the idea of the workshops, but I'll let you respond to that. Mm. Uh, I would love to be part of a, any workshop that <laughs> allows us to take the message out yeah. in a systematic and organized way. Mm -hmm. uh, back to WHO though, I would say that, look, I mean, I, as a medical graduate in India in training, uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, was something that we looked up to. Yeah, and and uh, it has done great work over the years, over the decades it's been around. So uh, all just respect for, I have just complete respect for an organization. And I think I would, I would latch on one specific thing about, as I mentioned earlier, the, the model, uh, the essential lists uh, that the WHO has come out with, I think that's something for us to not forget, that nicotine replacement therapy, let's start with that. Yeah. Let's not even jump to alternative products because it's kind also of- Also the services that should be on place. Absolutely, yes, yes. now the FCTC for example, <laughs> yeah, FCTC, the FCTC yes. requires as part yeah. of article 14 that yeah. tobacco dependence treatment has to be made available by the signatory countries. Now they all say, yeah, we're gonna do yeah. that. And, but if you go to the ground, the services don't exist. Yeah, it's go ignored. to the ground, the nicotine replacement products mm -hmm. are not even in the shop. Go to the biggest cities in some of the countries, go to Bangladesh and in Dhaka. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember going to a pharmacy there and I might have mentioned this in one of the sessions mm -hmm. and the pharmacist was just looking around for where to, <laughs> where is the NRT and they didn't have it obviously. Yeah. So for a country with a few tens of billions of tobacco mm -hmm. users, the biggest city with one of the best pharmacy shops does not have nicotine replacement yeah. therapy. So I think we should start with the basics where the WHO's uh, current guidelines requiring these things, but let's make them available first and then I think it's a matter of then step by step saying, well, do these not work? Mm -hmm. Do they need alternative products? Then go to that point. I think what perhaps may be happening is us talking about alternative products in, the, uh, in a perceived vacuum of, well, in the context of broader range of products, mm -hmm. sometimes is seen by uh, a, a community of those who are ideologically entrenched mm -hmm. to be just a way to push alternative products, which is not the case, right? We are not here to pr sell one or the other product. We are trying to get harm reduction actually implemented. And so that's perhaps a, a, a thing to, for all, us to, all of us to kind of work on, to be honest. That's a really <laughs> quite fascinating tactic, which I, I think we should probably explore, because I agree with you if, you. if the focus is on reducing smoking and reducing the death toll and disease associated yeah. with smoking, then the first steps are the first steps. And if we can use WHO as an accepted authority, mm -hmm. And then we can build on that as we need. Um, and I, I would say, again, go back to the UK, you know, it's long been obvious to me that often traditional smoking cessation services have not been well targeted oh. on the groups where the smoking rates are highest. Mm -hmm. we're, we're quite good at providing services in areas <laughs> where smoking rates are quite low, in areas, geographic areas, where smoking rates are very high. Mm -hmm. They're often the areas that are under financial pressure and you've seen a reduction in services. Accepting that there's a lot of work we can do with, if you like, um, mainstream physical medicine, are there any other sort of allied areas um, that we should also be looking to, you know, people, other groups who work with people who've got very high smoking rates? And I guess I am kind of trying to lead the witnesses a little bit here in that I know you both have some experience or interest in mental health, mm -hmm. where again, that's a group where we know there's some catastrophically high smoking rates. Mm -hmm. um, 
is there any scope there to try to engage those professionals who perhaps haven't traditionally seen smoking uh, rates as a, as a role? So, uh, uh, I am so quite new in this field, so mental field, it's new for me. But um, I, we have started uh, cooperation with uh, associations of psychiatrists in my country, and it's very interesting what's going on there at the moment in regards of tobacco harm reduction. So uh, uh, in our country, you know that smoking is banned in any hospitals except of uh, mental hospitals, because they had to allow them to smoke somewhere. Uh, and so there are rooms, and it's awful, because uh, they are not allowed. Uh, they are, they they are not using alternative products there, but they are smoking there. So there is one room uh, full of smokers, patients, uh, and uh, uh, the exposure of these toxins is higher, of course, and uh, uh, it's not a reduction of harm, yes. We are increasing harm there, and it's uh, awful. And yeah. we are not suggesting neither a replacement therapy or any alternative to them. Yeah, and can I just add to that? I'm, I'm yeah. In fact, it'll be, you'll be surprised to hear that even in the UK, which has evolved uh, policies in tobacco control, mm -hmm. uh, the expectation was that by 2018, uh, all the mental health facilities should have become smoke-free. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you really go and visit yeah. some of the sites, that is not implemented in practice. And this is one thing that I'm sure, Dave, we've talked about this in the past. You know that we focus, our Center for Health Research and Education focuses on bridging this policy practice gap Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is uh, the policy in the UK requires sites to be smoke-free. Mm -hmm. The best they do in many cases is put a sign that says we are a smoke-free site. Mm -hmm. Then there are people who are either smoking underneath, which is uh, one mm -hmm. thing, but the second is they often have to accompany psychiatric patients outside the campus at the entrance of the, the sort of the, the big, usually big campuses and uh, some healthcare assistant or a nurse has to accompany. So look at the, uh, this, this is almost like smoking is expected and accepted in the mental health setup, to your point. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, but also more importantly, smokers die, smokers with mental health problems, or mental health patients yeah, with who smoke, die on average 15 to 20 years earlier, not because of their mental health condition, because of a, a very likely a smoking-related disease. Mm -hmm. And if this fact is properly communicated to psychiatrists and the people who manage these hospitals, and then give them enough support in terms of how do you deliver cessation to these patients from the moment of admission throughout their stay. Their stay can be quite long sometimes. It's a long inpatient mm -hmm. stay, all the way to discharge and beyond. I think that can have a phenomenal impact in terms of health outcomes. And we cannot ignore mental health uh, as a kind of lower thing to worry about. The, the, the parity of esteem that's absolutely required in mental health as for physical health has to be understood, acknowledged, and actually acted upon. So uh, completely agree. That I that's an area of lack of uh, focus by a lot of people, but we are working on it and we are making some good inroads actually. Yeah, I mean, I am aware that there's been some progress and some of the mental health trusts have been quite progressive in, in the UK, but clearly more to be done. The point you made about premature death, uh, an extremely premature death, I think it reminds me of the fact that you know, rough sleepers, 44, 45, is an age, and a lot of the time that is smoking related illness yeah. uh, that's involved, as well as other factors. And it's really probably only in the last few years, and I'd say actually the pandemic really gave a kickstart to people thinking about the smoking, the smoking issues there. And again, we're starting to see some progress, but there is still a lack of maybe confidence um, amongst some of the practitioners. Um, so, how do we develop education? What sort of materials do you think we need to boost people in those, I'll call them allied professions work areas? What sort of materials can we produce them to give them the confidence to think, actually, this is something to do with us, and it is something we can manage within the services we already do? May I have a go at it yes, first? Yes. But look, I think, first of all, I want to congratulate you, Dave. I'm, I don't know if people know about the exceptional work you guys did in, uh, in, in helping out 
people with you know homeless people in the, in the times of the epidemic uh, i don't know if this conference has heard enough of it or at all yeah. uh, other people deserve greater <laughs> credit than me for sure but there was some excellent work done there's no doubt absolutely and i think the again it, it is a it's a matter of empathy and, and, and a humane approach right it's about giving access to everybody to the healthcare they deserve and in a country such as the uk which claims to be an advanced developed nation it's absolutely crucial not to leave anyone behind uh, for whatever reason so i think that work uh, hats off to you all the people involved in that and i think that's a big learning there you're right um, connecting that to what are the materials required i think uh, it goes back to who do these uh, healthcare practitioners or who are these uh, those who actually interface with people who are smokers either homeless uh, homeless uh, people or people in in prisons for example or those who are in mental health facilities who is their contact point and what does that person think about about nicotine about tobacco about yes, the harms that's one thing to assess but the second is who do they talk to do we want uh, 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 and and with all respect an mm -hmm. ivory tower academic to go and go on the streets of glasgow and start saying hey you know what mm -hmm. this is a product because i have published five papers on this and hence you should use this <laughs> i don't think it works at least i don't think it works uh, i've seen with medical professionals that they appreciate peer contact if mm -hmm. they know a peer if i go as a medical doctor which i am or or mm -hmm. people in my team go to their respective peers and talk about tobacco cessation from a practical experience not waving big books and saying you should follow this because yeah your right. example of the guideline is very very poignant <laughs> yeah. they exist and of course doctors are supposed to follow guidelines yeah. but they have like 5000 guidelines to look at and it always gets updated so for something to be for them to be able to comprehend and apply i believe that a peer based uh, hand holding process is important very uh, very practical materials when you see a patient who is a tobacco user who is smoking 30 cigarettes a day do not give that patient just a 2 mg nicotine mm -hmm. gum and say okay eat chew two gums in a day and that should be good that's not going to work most likely not going to work or the, the worst i have seen in in many cases is about when you prescribe nicotine gums uh, you say okay well just <laughs> take it and chew it they don't even tell about the chew and park technique which means that the first attempt to try the gum is going to lead to a massive throat irritation a bit of bit of hiccups yeah. acidity yeah. and the pay, the person's like you know what i was better off with my cigarette which is mm -hmm. so unfortunate and this is part of the reason why gums and patches yeah, have historically right. not worked because they were not prescribed properly had the doctors who prescribed them or the pharmacists who gave these products been trained properly i think mm -hmm. we would have different outcomes so mm -hmm. to your question sorry very long in answer <laughs> the i think it's about the right messenger giving the right message in a pithy form mm -hmm. i will stop excellent <laughs> no <it's okay. laughs> so uh no our focus in this case are doctors so we are trying to just raise awareness of doctors because they have no idea they have wrong um perception of nicotine first of all mm. uh, they have no idea about alternative products and we have all kinds of alternative products in our market and there are users there and uh, they don't know what to answer them so and um we are trying to organize uh, small meeting groups uh, discussions round tables working groups uh, uh, some conferences maybe uh, and each time we are just testing the awareness uh, before the event and after the event and uh, it may be only 20% sometimes it may be 70% sometimes rising of awareness but mm -hmm. each time what i think is that even if it's one doctor so mm -hmm. uh, one doctor has hundreds of patients and at least they won't tell them that alternative products are uh worse than <laughs> smoking or at least uh, uh we we will eliminate such risk i don't know because and uh, we won't tell uh patients that uh switch back to cigarettes <laughs> or quit it so at least that so i think that uh it needs time of course and it's difficult to reach all the doctors but we are trying <laughs> our best so and now we have started uh, conducting face to face interviews with them in every hospital and trying to reach every doctor but uh, i understand that only part of them maybe will change their mind or will accept the new perception uh, but uh, each time i tell to myself doctor is a bridge to the consumers because uh, they are the ones who are in face to face contact with the patients yes mm. 
and uh, patients mostly believe them, <laughs> at least they, when they address them, they, yes, uh, they rely on their opinion, and it's important. Opinion of doctors are very important. Yeah. I think you've both outlined an approach that could be applied to some <laughs> of the other areas, social workers, yeah. probation officers, other people who are working with, with a lot of yeah. groups. I do, and I think you've kind of touched on this, while in some ways you can say the range of products, the various types of, you know, we, we include NRT, so patches, um, gum, various types of pouches, mm -hmm. an incredible array of vaping type equipment. Do you think that intimidates some people outside this world because there's just so much of it, where do I start? You know, cigarettes appear relatively simple, don't they? You know, they're one basic product, it doesn't matter the brand so much. Whereas the range of alternatives, I think, does sometimes... I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult if people who don't understand it, it's just it's too much to engage with. Do you think there's an element of that? Do we need to demystify it, I guess? Is but the, the, uh, aren't there two different things? One is about demystifying what the product ultimately delivers, which is nicotine, and, and maybe in the case of, uh, and for adult consumers, obviously, flavors that are relevant for the, uh, for the adult uh, current smokers who need an alternative form of uh, safer alternative. So that's one thing about educating them about what is in it that's being delivered. Uh, but you know what, I, I, I kind of think this is a consumer world at the moment, and people are used to choice of a whole range mm -hmm. of things. There's a whole different, for example, mobile phones. I mean, there's a whole range of products. Some phones open up like that, and there's a lot of different things. And consumers find their way. They are smart enough. We, shouldn't ever, we should not ever underestimate their ability to navigate through the maze of product, product options, product upgrades, upgrades that happen over time. Um, and uh, we should kind of almost take their input on what's needed, because the last thing you want is put a product together that no one needs, and you can, and this kind of goes back in a, in a strange way to the medical licensing point, that there has to be a fine balance between making medically licensed products available for those who otherwise would not access them. So again, back to the mental health situation, mm -hmm. other situations where affordability is a problem. We do want products which are available with that sort of regulatory oversight, but also available at the last mile of tobacco use and consumption behavior there. But for a wider range of current users who, are, who don't think they are addicts or who don't, don't believe that they have any problem, uh, they should be able to go out and shop for products. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's a consumer market. It's like a caf cafeteria approach. You choose mm. this sandwich and that drink and that coffee and like, I want a decaf, I want a ca decaf cappuccino with soya milk. So if it's we okay. focus on the principles for the professionals, we can rely upon the People. consumer consumer market to uh, do the job, but I, I don't I don't want to get carried away and say look let it be a free for all. There has to be proper regulation sure. to ensure mm -hmm. that children and those who are underage and non-smokers should not take up these products. That's an absolute must. But with that yes. caveat, let's not uh, let's not forget that people need choice. Excellent. We've not got that much time left, so I'm going to ask the inevitable question. Really, we've just <laughs> celebrated ten years of GFN. What would you like to see in 10 years' time? You're, you're still here as a regular feature. <laughs> you're still telling people how wonderful <laughs> it is. So we're here. It's 2033. What are the t hot topics being discussed at GFN in 2033? Oh, first of all, uh, I hope that in 10 years uh, I won't be addressing everybody here asking to be a speaker somewhere there because we'll have a lot of our specialists at time, first of all, <laughs> experts in my country. And the second moment is that uh, I hope that uh, uh, there will be other party involved in the discussion as well. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be know them and us, and there will be just us discussing <laughs> and having arguments. That's it. So I think it's our main goal. Yeah, and thanks yeah. for uh, inviting me for the, the 20th GFN already. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for my pass. Uh, but look, uh, on, on a more serious note, uh, two related things. One is that hopefully in 10 years' time, uh, the myths around nicotine would have been busted once and for all. And related to that, I would think, and uh, coming back from chairing the session where Dr. Paul Newhouse talked about nicotine receptors and its role in cognitive function, but also, I think, more importantly, in some of the neurodegenerative disorders that the world is facing a crisis of, Alzheimer's yeah. and being one specific, but also pa Parkinson's. I, I do hope that the studies that they're doing give us some uh, hope in terms of 
potential role of nicotine in actually preventing or at least managing in early stages these diseases and 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 mankind and humankind rather should benefit from this drug in its as its own, on its own and not as part of a package of historical mm -hmm. risk and other issues around it and i wish that will be where we are in 10 years excellent uh, th there was a point from one of the um, speakers this morning that i i picked up on it, science is the art of disagreement. And uh, while there are definitely differences in view here, it would be really good to promote good scientific argument here, a a and yeah. across the sector. So uh, I, I definitely share some of your ambitions <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> having spent years going to drug policy conferences, which have their own ideological uh, separations. It, it, it's not a good thing that people don't yeah, um, challenge each other. Um, going back to a sort of one of the sort of fundamentals is how do we share and spread the, the data in the... There's, some, there's been some great research presented here. Some of what we know is quite but it's very hard to get it out of what I'll call the tobacco harm reduction bubble. So have you got any ideas about how we can reach out into sort of the, the, the broader science and research community? How do we, how do we prompt some um, professional curiosity around this phenomenon? Wow. Um, so well, I, I'll just uh, say that uh, we do not have uh, consumers associations or organizations in my country, and I liked it very much because uh, I think that uh, there should be some organizations. Of, so there should be consumers who will be talking about this because it's their rights, and uh, first of all, they should uh, uh, bring these messages and. Uh, um, I, I wish that uh, we'll have such kind of organizations in my country to say the truth, uh, but uh, you already have them and uh, I am just interested how it works. So when bringing this information out of the bubble, so how can you reach? Uh, maybe it's not enough just having <laughs> consumers, uh, but my understanding is that it should help. Maybe I, I'm mistaken. No, no, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. And if I were just to add one more, I know you're running off time, but uh, there are journalists uh, who are here, I believe, who have come from all around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. they are looking for the message, but also they will hopefully get more messengers, uh, local messengers, who can also be credible champions of the principle of tobacco harm reduction, but also examples of that being used by local uh, local patients, depending on where mm -hmm. what you're looking for, local patients, local consumer groups, who are benefiting from this uh, unequivocally, and they can write a sensible piece about it and, and actually disseminate that, that further beyond uh, just the, the bubble, the echo chamber of this. But I, I wouldn't call this just an echo. I think it's a great place for people to come and feel confident, safe, and be able to take something, yes. and that gives them the confidence to go back and talk about it. So as long as we are expanding the circle, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I, th I think it's interesting when you talk about the role of the media when uh, I possibly made the mistake of looking at some of the British media this morning and The Guardian, which would like to see itself as one of you know, responsible national papers with a focus on social issues, is talking about a tsunami of mm. dangerous vapes heading towards Britain. And I I'd like to think most of the media has moved on from that kind of language when talking about drug use and things. They still do revert sometimes, but I find it shocking that a paper like The Guardian uses a headline because it's like, it, it doesn't tell people how to deal with a problem. It's not practical. It, it's real sort of shock journalism. Everyone panic. Let's run around and panic. <laughs> um, which I, I think it's one of the values um, of GFN is hearing from how people around the world have coped um, with the scare stories and... and lots of the problems they faced and I'm very conscious that certainly in the UK we've been relatively lucky compared to, to many others. Mm. Um, Awareness rising of journalists will be very helpful I mm. think. Yes. Uh, also. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank you both very <laughs> much. So, um, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Your invitation to 2033 is in the <laughs> post <laughs> and uh, thank you. so is yours Sharina. Um, you. And now uh, it's my job to say goodbye to those watching online. Uh, I very much hope to see you in person at future GFNs.
And now let me hand over to Fiona in the uh, ballroom for the final session of GFN 2023. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, David. I know he can't hear me saying thank you. Um, the final session, look at you all. Thank you. You are the stayers. You are the last ones to leave the party. And, and I like those people. You know, we're the, ones, we're, we're the ones still there when they start putting up the chairs, putting the vacuum cleaners out, um, not serving you at the bar anymore. But um, good on you for staying. And, and I think this is going to be a really interesting final session because it is kind of a bit of a wrap-up of what we've all heard and learned over the last three or four days. And to be honest, it's a lot. Um, there was... I did a quick count. So there was over 26 presentations um, and workshops, uh, 78 presenters. Uh, interestingly, over a quarter, quarter of them were medical doctors, which I thought was interesting this time. And I don't know whether this is a record for GFN, but 82 countries have been represented here over the last four days. So that's really terrific. And we've got a nice broad range of people up here representing, well, weirdly, Australia is overrepresented on this, on this session, but um, sucko. Uh, that's in Australian. Um, so again, thank you all, and I'd just like to briefly um, introduce the panel. So to my to my direct right, we have Joe Thompson, who's with um, who's with Imperial, and he's in their Science and Regulatory Affairs Department. He's the director of that. I noted he also has an interest in cannabis. Is that right? Um, oh. I'm, I sit on on the safety board of a, a Canadian cannabis uh, company. Great, we can talk about that later. And 23 years experience in, um, in the science of nicotine containing products. Next is, is John Fell. And John, I wanted to make some joke about a smoking gun with you, like, because you're working with the Article 36, which is a um, charity organisation that looks at scrutinising um, the development and use of weapons, but that's not why you're here. Um, you have been following the developments of the tobacco and nicotine industries for over 30 years. Um, it looks from an, from an equity research analyst's perspective, um, also looking at the investments around this area. And you've also received, um, been currently doing a project from, with funding from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Um, Joel, uh, we have Joel Sawa who is a, I don't know that it's in his words, but in our words, a tobacco harm reduction crusader in Uganda. Um, he's really been at the forefront of getting people to, great, to have a better understanding of what THR is in Uganda and the broader African region. Um, he's been doing that for um, four years. A past recipient of one of the the scholars from the, from GAC and a board member of the campaign for safer alternatives, so it shows the sort of work that the scholar scholarship program does, and to have someone like Joel here joining us today. Also, if anyone is travelling to that part of the world, he runs um, safari tours. So I uh, just quick plug for you there, Joel. And to my far left, my, um, my friend and, and colleague in Australia, Colin Mendelson, who is a um, medical practitioner, has been a warrior in tobacco harm reduction in Australia. And as many of you will have heard and read, you know, we are facing a significant force against tobacco harm reduction in Australia. Um, Colin's been working in this area of, you know, smoking cessation for over 40 years. Um, he ran a terrific workshop, which I hope some of you were able to attend um, on the first few on the first day of this. Um, he's a member of the expert advisory group um, on the Royal Australian Australian College of General Practitioners, and he has been making some headway in tobacco harm reduction in that area. But um, as I'm sure he will tell you, it has been slow. So I thought 
the way we would go with this last um, this last session is the the panelists up here will provide a, a bit of a reflection on um, on the last three or four on the last few days of the conference, but also recognising the theme of the conference, which is um, to the next dec tobacco harm reduction, the next decade. So they'll all sort of give their refle reflections and thoughts and takeaways about the issues that will be facing us both now and, and, in, and in the coming decade. And then rather than opening it up to questions, although you are welcome to ask questions if you still have some after four days, uh, but more importantly, I think I'd really love to hear from some of the people who haven't spoken at the conference. And I'd love to hear their reflections on the forum and, and on where they think we are going in the next decade. So I'm really, you know, rather than saying that's a comment, not a question, I'm, I'm actually welcoming um, comments, brief comments, um, uh, as, as we kind of wind, wind up this, this really wonderful GFN. So Colin Singh, as you were last, um, you're going first. Uh, so, yeah, Colin, if you'd like to start start us off. Yes, look, I'd like yes, to start up. by, by <laughs> disagreeing with you, um, Fiona. If the wife turned the microphone off, because I'm this is, is this on? It's on. Okay, good. Um, Fiona said earlier, in Australia, we're leading the way on what not to do uh, regarding vaping, and she apologised for that. Well, I take a very different view. I'm very proud of our willingness to lay our lives down. Um, it, as the placebo arm of a randomised controlled trial, um, sacrificing uh, ourselves in the sake of public health and humanity. And um, I think we'll um, achieve great results as a result of that. And Australia should be very proud for taking this. Someone had to do it. And, and we've okay, made, I stand made corrected that there, Colin. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and I mean, we've, we've made it very clear in Australia that bans don't work. I mean, we all know bans don't work and prohibition and harsh restrictions don't work. And we, we have a huge black market and criminal gangs and, you know, huge issues with enforcement and youth vaping. I mean, how much more information do we need to be clear about this being the wrong approach? Um, we're all aware of it. Unfortunately, the very much closed off um, political leaders Fiona accepted, uh, are unwilling to um, open the door to that, that, um, that information. Um, th I just wanted to say a little bit about evidence because it was talked about a lot by a number of different people. And um, Sarah said we must have evidence for scientific credibility, and we must, and we do have the evidence. And John Oyston said we have enough evidence, and I really agree with him from a, a practical point of view. We can always have more evidence, and we need more evidence. There's always little points yet to make, but we have enough evidence. And one of the reasons we need more continuing research is, as Roberto said, there's so much bad science around. And unfortunately, it gets weaponised and used against us, and we have to have replication studies, and we have to have more scientists analysing that junk data, um, which is weaponised by the media and the publishers and is, doesn't reflect the real uh, situation on the ground. But the problem is that we don't get a chance to debate the evidence. And this is another issue that's come up repeatedly in the conference, it's very true in Australia, that the people who oppose vaping, you know, it's almost a religious cult, as someone said, they've made up their minds, this is the evidence, and they refuse to debate us. And we, we find this in Australia. We've repeatedly invited Simon Chapman to debate us. It's much safer to have a rant on a radio program with a journalist who can't address the clearly um, mistaken um, arguments that he uses. Um, not to mention any names, and hello, Simon, he's probably watching. Um, but, um, you know, we would love to have the opportunity to address and debate the issues politely, respectfully, uh, we don't get the opportunity, and that's true in so many other countries. Um, and then on that issue too, the science in Australia is often censored by medical journals. We've had significant problems with the Medical Journal of Australia, the Australian New Zealand Journal of Public Health. We recently um, 
had a pub an article, a letter published after eight revisions in the Medical Journal of Australia. Um, another uh, article which I wrote to the Journal of Public Health, um, they initially refused to even look at it until we sent in a letter signed by experts saying, you can't just not look at it, you've got to consider this. So they said, OK, we'll publish it. Then they said they were going to retract it three months later because of a spurious conflict of interest. So I, I'm just bringing these examples up to show you what we're up against and, and how the forces are, are lined up against us, uh, the, the, uh, the journals and the, the, the media in Australia. Um, but as Moira said, ultimately the evidence will prevail. And I really believe that. I mean, there's only so long I think they can hold out. And I do think that if we persist, eventually, you know, it's just untenable to be able to say that we don't have the evidence and the evidence. And, and, and from the, the natural experiment in Australia, I think that we have very good evidence um, as, as our smoking rates have not declined for the last five years have not declined for the last five years. Whereas in New Zealand, they fell by 33% in two years from 2020 when they legalised vaping. I mean, this is as good an evidence base as you can get, I think. Um, and that Mara was said, <clears throat> and Alex Wadak's always saying, things change, history is always changing. We just did a tour of Europe, parts of Europe, and. It's always one civilization after another. Things that you think are locked in will never change. Uh, things change. And, um, you know, with harm reduction, disruptive technologies, they're always resisted. They always change. It will happen. Hopefully, we'll live long enough. Um, just in terms of the next 10 years, um, yeah, I agree with some of the other speakers that I think this is a political issue. And I don't think we're going to win this on the evidence. Um, and I think there'll be a point where there's a critical mass of vapours and we're seeing the number of vapours building up. There has to be pressure on the politicians and I think that's where we're going to make the change. Now, if you work it out in Australia, we have hundreds of vapours in each electorate and you know, politicians are concerned about being getting re-elected more than anything else. The problem is we need to get the vapours motivated. Now, I was very inspired by the stories about the UK, those early vapours who turned the corner for the, the direction vaping was taking. In Australia, unfortunately, our vapours have not been motivated and part of that's been because it's been illegal to vape. They're afraid to stick their heads up because of all the risks. But I really think we've just formed our, a vapours association only just now. Um, we had one several years ago which sort of fell apart and I'm hoping with that organisation and getting vapours to visit their MPs and we're constantly encouraging them. I personally think that's the way forward. Uh, and I think somebody else said that in the, in the meeting. Um, and we need to educate the general public as well because they also drive the debate. Uh, but I think the debate is being driven more than anything else by the youth vaping uh, moral panic. And I think we need to actively address that. Because in my opinion, vaping is actually protective to youth. I mean, I know that's a terribly controversial thing to say, and I'll never say it outside this room, although it's probably already being repeated online. But <clears throat> the fact is that vaping is diverting young people away from smoking. And, and it's protecting their parents from dying. And I think if you look at it overall, I think it's very clear that vaping is a good thing for young people. I'm not saying young people should start vaping. OK, let me just put that out there first. But really, when you look at the overall impact, I think vaping's been good for young people. And um, please don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure when we'll be able to say that. Look, that's probably the main points I wanted to make. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. And I think it, it goes from that reflection um, that Alex Wodak has said to me a number of times that things that can't go on forever don't. Um, and I think that's... Yeah, that kind of captures some of those points that you you were making. I meant to mention Alex. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Joel, uh, yeah, as coming from, and I think this has been the wonderful thing about this conference this time is that we have heard from so many different countries, and so I'd love to hear your reflections. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, uh, my discussion will be along my experience uh, 
for starters in my country also in relation to the region and also what uh, this GFN represents in the same. Uh, the GFN this year represents uh, what uh, THR has evolved or morphed into over the past few years. And uh, for me, I was very interested when we early uh, on uh, a discussion that uh, uh, was hosted by Will Godfrey, one of the discussions rather. It, uh, there's a, it, it uh, went, uh, it was, it, the discussion was about the, general, the global perspective of THR. And one of the things that came out clearly was that uh, there's a lot to be done and, uh, in terms of uh, the regions, the various challenges that uh, advocacy is facing. Uh, one thing which was clear to me, like I mentioned earlier when we were talking, is that uh, it comes to show that some of the challenges, challenges we're experiencing globally are similar somewhat. So region by region, challenges may be along policy, uh, the public health ch challenges that are revolving around are combustibles. So they're not too different, really. The dyna dynamics may be different. You might find that maybe down in Africa, our biggest limitations may be funding in particular ways here and there. But then again, in other places, the challenge might not necessarily be funding. Okay, the, de the degree varies, yes. But then again, in some areas, you might find the issue is the uptake of the, of, uh, of the legislators, so to speak. In my country particularly, um, uh, safer nicotine alternatives are banned entirely. There's a blanket ban that uh, was passed um, in 2015 that renders it illegal to distribute, to sell, to promote electronic cigarettes and any, any, other, any other form of uh, safer, nicotine, safer nicotine alternative. Now, uh, what we do down there is uh, we do more of education because, as we all know, THR in itself is an intellectual concept. It raises discussion. It raises uh, debate. So, like, uh, it, like it was said earlier in the last session, indeed, what is missing in many points is uh, the aspect of debate. So, if that is impeded, not too much knowledge is able to be disseminated. Yeah. And uh, we first, uh, there's a lot of hostility, I notice, around uh, the discussion of, SN, uh, of uh, safer nicotine products. No, this is not limited to one region alone. Uh, one region alone. This is general. Okay. Uh, we find that uh, tobacco control is uh, very well, like uh, it was said in the last session by Constantinos, they are, the tobacco control is not disorganized. They're not the Wild West, so to speak. They are homogeneous. They are very well planned out. Their tactic is very clear. They are out to limit the, how far THR can go, or even so, kill it in totality if possible. Yeah. So what, what, uh, what are we going to do as the as the fraternity behind uh, tobacco harm reduction? How are we going to uh, how are we going to address this? It's a question I asked actually in, a, in one of the sessions. I'd, uh, I'd asked a similar question. I'd asked um, the question was. How are we, as a, uh, as a tobacco harm reduction, going to? Uh, how are we going to evolve? What rather? What are we going to? How are we going to transition with the changes that are coming over time? Because we see that uh, governments and uh, tobacco control are eagerly coming up with new tactics day and night. When you think you have one uh, one end covered, they have a new they have a new approach to how to pull you down. So how then are we ourselves going to uh, counter this as well? Because it means it must be pro we should be adaptive and progressive as well. As the prog as, as the ch uh, in relation to the changes that keep coming, we should also be working there and I to see how best we can counter this. And uh, I also do agree that uh, it is uh, tobacco harm reduction in itself is uh, political has uh, political addresses, and this is not cheap as well. So this uh, comes to cover the aspect of funding on a general level because uh, tobacco control is a well-organized machine that is uh, well-oiled financially, so to speak. I do not know how we will get the, how these finances uh, will be accessed. I, I can't point a finger at uh, point a finger, but I think we need to come up with ways and mechanisms that are able to ensure that we're able to get um, funds that are able to push projects, uh, push uh, discussions around the same, around uh, tobacco harm reduction, so to speak. And uh, also, I, I um, think we need 
more of this fora, but in a localized sense. Um, we've been having meetings uh, back, I'm sure across the continent, several countries, because some of the, some of the scholars, uh, some who are not present, have held meetings in their countries uh, by support of uh, the, uh, the, pro the, pro the, pro the, pro the program, the scholarship program. They've had uh, stakeholder meetings and uh, the like, but some of the, uh, and these discussions have yielded uh, quite a bit of result. Because you see, you're able to gather uh, some uh, policy makers, influencers, uh, members, several stakeholders, including uh, members of the media, uh, medical fraternity, and the like. And this allows people to learn because in most parts of uh, most of parts of Africa, where I come from, um, it is still a it's, it's still mysterious. It's still not well understood. So the challenge is up to us to keep on demystifying this concept every other time. So when you have more localized fora, there will be more there will be more engagement, more understanding, more education, and uh, like yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> In this sense, I believe that uh, advocacy is uh, very much needed. Okay. Uh, we cannot undermine the place of advocacy together with every other area that covers THR because THR is rather wide. There is the advocacy, there is the involvement of the experts, the involvement of the academicians and all the like, the media and all that. But then again, there needs to be, uh, I think advocacy also needs, the, needs to be, the various advocates around the globe need to put in more effort to make sure that their people, uh, the consumers are reached out. There needs to be more consumer-centered uh, advocacy we actually deal with the people who are affected. Yeah, they, I, think, I, uh, I appreciate intellectual discussions, but I think if you actually go down and you engage the person who's really, really directly affected, the result can change or alter a thinking of uh, somebody in one or the other. And it's then, only then uh, are you able to come in and advise the policy makers because then you've talked to the people who are using and the people who are affected. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to, in the next uh, decade, what do I uh, foresee, or what, do I, what, are, what are my expectations? Um, just a minute. Oh, I see a time where we'll have more involvement uh, of uh, the doctors, the medical uh, fraternity, where, um, Clinicians uh, will be where there will be more dialogue, uh, more science advanced. Uh, sorry, just a minute. Where there will be more, uh, where, 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 where doctors will, where, where clinical, uh, where, where doctors will be able to deal with patients from a more uh, informed point of view where so safer nicotine alternatives will be presented as a form of remedy without necessarily having to, without the struggle that there is right now. It will, where, um, some of, where the electronic cigarettes, snooze, and the like can be easily accepted, as well as uh, nicotine replacement, replacement therapies. There would be a form of succession that would be endorsed in many places. I don't know. I'd like to see a time where the WHO is able to come to, a to, to the table and, have, and they being, be involved in these discussions, yeah? having uh, meetings where consumers are present and actually engaging in their own problems so that uh, we, can have, uh, uh, we can have more uh, consumer-oriented uh, policies. Yeah? But I also foresee a time where there, will be more campaign there are going to be more campaigns, uh, more campaigns, uh, uh, Nothing, without, not, nothing for us without us, yeah? There'll be more campaigns towards that, so that uh, it will no longer be, it will be the, the, the voice of the consumers much, much more, more so than it has previously been. Yeah, thank you. Ah, thanks, Joel. And I, I think it, it goes back to what you said right at the beginning, that everything that you've said is something that we almost, that everyone in this room has in common, that, that, that voice, the lack, the lack of voice for the consumer um, the lack of education um, in in every area, and I think you know in Uganda, I'm no doubt, um, given the, the the politics there 
um, it is difficult to speak against a government like that. And I certainly um, have been reading with horror some of the stuff that's happening with the LGBTI community in Uganda. And, you know, so more power to your arm. Um, John. Thanks, Fiona. I'm going to run through my four kind of, I guess, highlight themes from, from the last few days. Actually, starting with, with um, before I got here, I watched the video that Clive Bates put up, and there's a, I thought yeah, there's a really interesting line in there, he said, which is, if you ask an academic about nicotine use, you get a stupid answer. It's just about people getting hooked by nasty companies, but, which is not the answer you get from the people who smoke. And I think, for me, there's still some cognitive dissonance in this field, if that's the right term, and maybe at this conference as well. You know, consumers aren't helpless victims very often. They've got agency, they're making choices about pleasure. But the tobacco industry is still basically seen as evil. Um, and if people don't believe that, they at least don't challenge that concept very often. We've, we've got still a very cartoon view of the tobacco industry globally. It's very US-centric, and it misses a lot of the complexities about how the industry actually developed globally. I remember in one of the sessions, I think it was Cozy said, it would help THR if tobacco companies would sell their combustible business. I think there was a colorful phrase, it's hard to put reformed paedophiles in charge of the kindergarten. And you know, lots, lots of people here, I'm sure, wish the tobacco industry would go away, but it's, it's, it's not going to. They don't have any choice but to get involved in tobacco harm reduction, and that is increasingly being driven by investors. As you, and as you mentioned, Fiona, I'm doing this project for the foundation to see if there are ways of stepping that engage, engagement of investors uh, up, ramping it up. Same thing I want to talk about, or has really, really um, stood out for me, is that discussion about does nicotine have benefits? I thought that session from Paul Newhouse this morning was fantastic. It li literally mind-boggling. And I also like that line that Garrett McGovern said yesterday, you know, let's, let's get nicotine out of jail and see what the benefits are. And you can regard that maybe as a distraction from what tobacco harm reduction is about, but I reckon that if you, if you do start to rehabilitate nicotine, that will be helpful. Uh, it will help counter the misinformation that even lots of the medical profession have about that, you know, villain Nick Oteen being the major problem. And then we also can maybe have a more nuanced debate about addiction, you know, about whether nicotine, as opposed to smoking, really does fit the classic definition of, of you know, addiction being something that brings additional real adverse consequences with it. Um, I think, Joel, you've, you've sort of hinted at this in, 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 or mentioned it in your bit as well. But third thing is, is, is that the tobacco harm reduction debate isn't just about vaping, although that obviously tends to dominate discussions, especially in the, in the media. Now, I, I used to think pouches were not a product for me, but thanks to Thomas and Cecilia, um, I've had a go at this week and rather enjoyed them. So maybe it is a product I like. And... And then we've heard quite a lot about medicinal products as well. And, um, you know, whether people like it or not, I'm sure we are going to get some medicinal nicotine products coming onto the market or a wider range of them. And I understand the concerns that people have about that. But again, I think it will be helpful in the end. You know, the more products there are out there for people to choose from, the more channels they're available in, the better and the, and, and the quicker, um, you know, the smoking habit can be reduced. And then finally, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, rose-tinted spectacles, and so what has stood out for me is also progress despite adversity. You know, how many users of the, uh, uh, in the world were there of, of safer nicotine products 10 years ago? You know, maybe 10, 20 million? I mean, the great work that Harry has done in the global state of tobacco harm reduction, he, I think they estimated 112 million in 2021, despite what we all know has been a massively challenging environment. Um, and, and, you know, a difficult environment to make the case for THR. So there's progress, not, not enough, obviously, but I do believe that number's gonna keep growing. And even in the US, you know, despite the 
shit show there, that the data from Outria's consumer track is still showing that the number of vapors is growing steadily, you know, year after year, at least in for, you know, the last four or five years. I've really enjoyed hearing a bit of perspective from places I don't know that much about, frankly. South America, uh, you were with me there in the Central Asia presentation. You know, the optimism that's coming out of some parts of Asia. So, yeah, there were loads of difficulties, loads of regulatory barriers, the personal attacks, some terrible behavior by tobacco harm reduction opponents. But the cat, for me, is out of the bag now, and I don't think you're going to be able to stop consumers finding this stuff out for themselves and getting hold of the products one way or another. And you know, to mix metaphors, the train is left, left the station as well when it comes to the big tobacco companies knowing they've got to transform and there isn't any going back. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, John. And I think um, you're absolutely right. Like even in, even in Australia, where we have some of the more draconian laws and, you know, uh, quite awful legislators and regulators on this, we, we've seen a steady increase in consumers and we're now over a million people in Australia um, are now using um, safer, safer nicotine, nicotine products. So thank you for ending on such a, on such a, a an optimistic note. Um, Joe. Thank you. The challenge to say something that's not already been said. Um, I'm going to start with something you certainly would have heard before. The problem is always leadership. The solution is always leadership. This is my first GFN. I've not been here before. And the sessions I've sat in, the conversations I've had with so many of you, many of those things I've wholeheartedly agreed with. And the remainder has made me stop, think, listen, and try and understand. And on a personal note, I, I thank you for that challenge. What I see is leadership in each of your fields, the stakeholders that you represent, is leadership. And I commend you for that and, in, and encourage you in that. Despite what you might think of me, despite my affiliation with a multinational tobacco company. And I leave here with optimism. And my optimism starts in Australia. Thank you. <laughs> I am optimistic. And I'm optimistic for two reasons. For one that I think you, you alluded to um, at the beginning, which is showing the world how not to do it. And what will be important is how that story is told. The second is one of the consequences, which was the rise of illicit trade. Now, I'm not optimistic about illicit trade. Please don't misunderstand or misrepresent me. But it reminds us of the consumer, and that ultimately the consumer will choose. And what's happening there is because of consumer choice. And in a session, I forget which day it was now, one day blurs in, in, into the next, um, but that, that, that Clive ran, um, reflecting back on the last 10 years and reminded us of the consumer advocacy um, with MEPs in preventing uh, licensing of vaping products at that time. And as a tobacco company, it reminds us that the consumer comes first and ensuring that we have reduced risk products that meet their needs. Ultimately, they'll choose. We can have products with great science behind them, but if it doesn't meet the needs of consumers, they won't choose them. So that's our challenge, Imperial's challenge. And I've heard frustration. I've heard frustration from different groups, from low and middle income countries at the pace the speed of making those products available. And I don't believe it's for the big multinationals to solve on their own. 
But I do believe they have a role. And that, for me, is to take that back and look at those barriers um, and look at what our role is um, in addressing the barriers and the opportunities for making reduced risk products, making that consumer choice available. The other reasons for being optimistic, regulation. We heard a phenomenal case study from the Philippines around how a regulatory framework um, has been involved and some of the challenges to get there that has at the heart of it harm reduction. I also heard last week uh, and was confirmed by someone made a comment, um, I forget again which, which day, that it's changing in Thailand um, with respect to vaping. So there are reasons to be optimistic. The European Tobacco, but pro tobacco Product Directive is, is under review. That'll be three. I think in 10 years' time, we'll be hurtling towards four. And there's reason to be optimistic about that too. We are seeing, on the one hand, a risk, a risk of further prohibition. On the other, we are seeing member states that wish to take regulation into their own hand, which might lead to greater prohibition or might lead to more freedom under that directive and therefore the opportunity for someone to take leadership. Because what is needed is a country somewhere to develop that framework for harm reduction for these products, starting with not how do we regulate the product, but how do we help the consumer. There are a billion smokers on a billion different journeys. And that framework needs to be robust. It needs to be, to be able to be repeatable. It needs product standards that are not a barrier to entry, but product standards that guarantee safety, quality, efficacy. And it needs enforcement. Enforcement to protect youth through youth access prevention, um, which is a societal issue. The other reason for optimism is the science. There is a lot of good quality science demonstrating reduced risk potential of products. And if we fast forward 10 years, what will be layered on top of that is a beginning of data that shows um, the public health benefit of those products. We're seeing a bit already, we've heard this week in terms of the UK, and um, its approach to vaping and how it's regulating vaping and the freedom for consumers and the consequence of, of uh, smoking incidents falling. But we will have data in 10 years' time beyond population health modelling, which is what we currently do. So I think there is reason um, for, for optimism. Um, our part in that, we are starting um, what we term actual use studies, whereby we are tracking smokers in uh, three countries, UK and, and France in vaping and the Czech Republic on heated tobacco, with no intention to quit smoking. And we are, we are tracking them um, on using those reduced risk products to look at how do they, what's, what's their experience over time? Does it help them cut down smoking? Does it help them quit? What works, what doesn't? And using that data to demonstrate, well, to tell us two things. One, to demonstrate um, harm reduction in practice in a country. And the other is to provide information on barriers and drivers to further help us develop products that are gonna meet their needs. So I, I do think that there are reasons for, for optimism. Um, 
it's important that we continue, no matter how difficult it is to, to, to publish, but to publish science and have that peer-reviewed and open to scrutiny and, and debated. Um, and that is part of our role, industry's role, Imperial's role, in um, correcting one of the biggest barriers to um, harm reduction, which is a misinformation on, on nicotine. I don't think that's something that Imperial or the multinationals can solve um, because we won't be, we listen to, um, but we do, we do have a role in that. And I'll, I'll perhaps finish with this because I'm, I'm remind, reminded of, of, of an of a old proverb. And it's, well, how do you take the optimism and realise that so it doesn't become unrealised hope, hope that's failed? And for me, if the vine, the promise of new wine is harm reduction, we have to continue to beware the foxes that ruin the vine. And I'll stop there. Thank you. That was beautifully poetic to, 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 finish, to finish that on. And I, you know, I concur, obviously, with, with, with all of your contributions. Um, and I certainly... In thinking this, and as someone who's been involved in harm reduction for decades, um, it's it's now I'm leaving here thinking about the allies that we need to bring back into the room. So it is the the harm reduction um, the, the harm reduction community that's out there fighting for you know safer sex use, that's fighting for um, needle and syringe programs, that's. But those people have not, have not been in the room on tobacco harm reduction, and I think that's a great opportunity to bring them in. I think also touching on the the equity issues that have been raised and the fact that um, it's it's our most vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. It's some of our developing countries and communities that 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 need probably the most assistance and probably have the most need for tobacco harm reduction. So how do we engage with the communities that are working with those organ with those um, communities? So how do we work with the people working with our disadvantaged and vulnerable communities in our in our countries and in and and in our um, in 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 the areas that we live? Uh, you know, it's been. Um, the, the hate and the anger that was mentioned in the previous session coming from the um, tobacco control activists in some ways does, you know, and I think Nancy pointed this out, it feels like the dinosaurs last roar and that we're really, they, they are sort of yelling at the clouds and, um, and, and making themselves miserable as well as probably making us miserable. But... It's been remarkable how um, none of that anger has, has seems to have prevent, presented itself at this conference. There has been great optimism at this conference. There has been a great desire for conciliation and, and in some cases reconciliation at this conference. And I think that puts us in very good stead to go forward because we're going forward in an optimistic um, way. We're going forward with science on our side. Um, as, as difficult as it is for scientists, and I know, and I certainly, Alex Wodak mentioned it to me um, during one of the breaks, you know, if you are a young researcher, to be looking at tobacco, to be looking at nicotine is difficult, and it is still difficult, but it's happening, and they, people are doing it. And, you know, I, I think I've always been nervous about the involvement of the industry um, and having come to GFNs over the, the years, I've really come to the, the quite right conclusion that the industry has to be part of the solution. Um, and we, we say that when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about a whole bunch of other issues, we say, well, the coal industry has got to be part of the solution. Um, industry has to be because you, you have the resources and, you know, it's, it's your consumers um, that we're talking about. And I think finally, and I think the most important point that we have heard throughout this is the voice of the consumer and the need for the voice of the consumer to be at the centre. So if our tobacco harm, if our tobacco control um, regulators could look at the problem of trying to save people's lives 
as quickly as possible and prevent people from dying as quickly as possible rather than trying to kill the tobacco industry, which seems to be the, the, the focus, um, and listen to the consumers, as we've, we've, all, we've all said, then we will progress in the next 10 years, and I have no doubt we will. And again, going back to what you just said, Joel, by, by the leadership that has been shown by all of the presenters that we've seen at this, um, at this forum and over the last four days. So thank you to all of the panellists. Please feel free to ask the panellists questions. Great, in one minute. Um, or a few seconds. Um, the other thing that I, as I mentioned at the, at, the, at the start, I'm really interested to hear from people who haven't spoken at the conference, and I'd love to hear your own personal reflections. If this has been your first GFN, how have you found it? Um, you know, what, what, what takeaways are you, are you leaving, uh, leaving Warsaw with? But to start this off, gentlemen in the back. My name is Khosi Litlape from South Africa. And I just want to go back to the reference to the comments that I've made and just give a perspective where they come from. Uh, there's a bill that has been presented in my country which basically criminalizes harm reduction. Where effectively parts of the bill say that if you claim that uh, one tobacco product is less harmful than another, or it reduces risks. That would be punishable by 10 years imprisonment and or a fine. So I just want people to understand when I make a plea that there should be separation of combustibles from non-combustibles so that we could begin to fight the fact that effectively harm reduction is being criminalized in our own country. And it's because of the conflation of saying these things are just as terrible as combustible cigarettes. And harm reduction is a ruse. So I, I, I just wonder how the panel thinks you could assist us in that regard. And I'm appealing to the whole house that uh, this bill will be coming up for publication, public comments, and even people from outside the country can comment on that because we are on a path that is even far more radical than what you have in Australia or elsewhere where they've create, they are creating an ipso facto ban on reduced risk products with a threat of imprisonment. So the sentences for various offenses range from three months to 20 years. If you smoke near a door or a window, it will be three months. If you allow somebody to smoke in your own house, outdoor, and you've employed a domestic worker, it's 10 years. So we're having criminalization of smoking and criminalization of harm reduction. How can you assist? Wow. And you're legalizing cannabis. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, would any of the panelists like to comment on what seems extraordinarily draconian Legislation. I wasn't clear. Are they criminalising smoking or vaping? Both. Uh, what they've done, they've described smoke as anything. Mm. So whether it's a combustible cigarette, an e-cigarette, a heat not burn product, they are all the same. Mm. So they are being put into the same category. But, but, but remember, the target is the new product. Yeah. Because they're but, going to have difficulty changing legislation for the combustibles. So the trick from public health is to say there's absolutely no difference and yeah. they are going into the issues of the WHO about gateway, about these things being more toxic mm. than cigarettes, etc. So they didn't learn from the ban during the COVID period where they banned cigarette sales and yet they had this huge underground market and cigarette sales increased. No, they, they, they haven't learned from that. As, as has been said, you know, it's okay to take money from the tobacco industry if you are government. But if you're a citizen, you can't. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the, the inevitable out outcome of this will be an increasing black market. Of course, people will want to continue to smoke and smokers will want to continue to vape and they're going to find a way to do it. So 
I, I mean, we, we, we there are quite a few countries that criminalise, uh, you know, ha harm reduction products. In Australia, you can go to jail for up to two years for vaping without a prescription. There are fines up to forty-five thousand dollars, fines up to two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for importing without a prescription, and there are a number of other countries which criminalise vaping, but which um, it's a question of to what extent they try to enforce it. There are a lot of countries like India and. Um, um, many others, which I can't think of right now, but they, 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 they criminalise, but yet people do it anyway. It's a question of how actively it's enforced. I'm wondering how actively they are going to enforce, because I can't see it working. I mean, it does, it, this sort of thing never works in I, the long run. I think we might just... Cigarettes or anything. But if I go out as a health activist and I go on a radio programme, and I say uh, e-cigarettes pose less harm than combustible cigarettes. Mm. It will be a criminal offence and I can go to jail for yeah. 10 years. Mm. So it's beyond not just the users, yeah. it's even about advocacy. Yeah. I think that's quite, quite, quite com also true in, in, in many other countries as yeah. well, that you can't make that claim. It's certainly true but, in Australia and I think in the United States. Um, I, yes, I'm not sure. John... I'm well, I'll just... To, to say a couple of things, I'm sorry, I wasn't meaning to pick on you with my remarks earlier, but you know, for me, you, you, you have to tackle that in the end with information and with trusting people to work it out for themselves. Mm. I mean, how can you control information like that? How can, you, how can you stop people in South Africa finally becoming aware, looking on the internet, that they're being lied to, not told the, yeah. not told the truth? And, and you, right, for me, you tackle that situation with information. And, and merely specifying who can or can't sell a particular type of product isn't really going to do with that. Look at, look at the US, where there are you know, a lot of, lot of vaping companies with, with no tobacco connections. It doesn't stop them being vilified. Mm. So that, I, don't, I don't think that's the answer, sadly. No. I, I think it's certainly something that we, we all in this room should be um, sharing and being made aware, we're aware of. So thank you for alerting us to it. Robert, Mr. Wiki. Thank you. Um, Richard Prone from Sorry. Safe the Nicky, with Nicotine Wiki. Um, all I wanted to say was um, I share the, the sort of promise and I look back on how far we've come, mm. and even though this is my first GFN, I've followed everyone since the start, um, and I just want people to remember you know, the progress we've already made and the positives we've already had, the positive effects we've already had on you know, the people who are most important, the, the consumers of tobacco products, those people that smoke, that don't want to anymore, and we've helped so many of them thus far, we need to keep going, we need to keep getting better, we need to find new ways to reach those people who want to make a positive change in their life. I wonder if the, the panel would like to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Joe or jo, uh, Colin? And while they are responding, I want people in the audience to be thinking, I want to hear from people who haven't spoken or this is their first GFN to, to also put your hand up. Yeah, look, I think that's a very positive point to make, Richard, that we have come an enormous way. I mean, look at this conference and... Um, a lot of the activity in this field, we, 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 you get very discouraged, but we need to also keep our heads up considering how far we have come. And the rate at which change is happening is very reassuring. Um, I can't remember the second part of the question, but that's... Maybe. Oh, it was just to, um, to keep positive and... To to look for new ways to actually, as to how we can help people who we haven't actually managed to reach so far. 
Thanks. I think there's a that's a there's more uh, research going on. The, I think there's need for more research, okay? And uh, I foresee that happening, more activity towards uh, enhancing even the technology that is already presently uh, being used. So yeah, I think there's a lot to look forward to in terms of, uh, in an optimistic sense, yeah. Great, does anyone else have some reflections or comments? Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Um, Charlie Hampshire Thomas, do you think each of you, uh, Joe, I did like your comments about leadership, but do you, each of you think there are areas where there needs to be more collaboration between stakeholders? We've heard about environmental waste this week. Uh, you've just mentioned product standards, uh, gaps in science. Um, I, you know, there might be several areas. Do you think there are some of these areas some of the stakeholders could work together on? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think all of them, to be honest. I, I don't think any, any one party, any stakeholder w will, will achieve what needs to be done and, and realise you know, the, the hope and the optimism that we have w w without it. it it's got to be through collaboration. It's got to be working with stakeholders who won't always agree um, and, 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 and doing that collectively. Um, and that means... Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, p pulling people together that... I think the, dif the difficulty is, with the exception of those that are in the room, is, that, that is those that don't want to be in the room. Um, and, you know, learning from some of, some of the, 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 the... Well, the, the analogy with... Um, was it Chapman? Simon. Simon, thank you. You know, by, by turning up, you, you confirm there's something to debate. And I think that's that's part of part of the, and therefore they don't engage because it, it it means well there's something to solve here when they've already got the answer. So I think that's part of the, the the challenge to overcome. But absolutely, I think in all of these areas, whether it's sustainability, environmental, core harm reduction, regulatory or policy on on tobacco harm reduction, uh, yeah, it's leadership. Um, but you need the guiding coalition um, to make leadership effective. Thank you. I, I just meant, well, I'd mentioned a couple of fields. I mean, there are more, but um, my personal hobby horses, I suppose. One, one is David Sweeners about data, um, which I'm, I suppose I'm attuned to because of my financial hat as well. But lots of places around the world, if you're trying to work out what the size of the reduced harm tobacco nicotine product market is, it's just very, very difficult. There aren't good figures. Very difficult, especially in vaping, to know because it's not excise in other places, how big the market is, what demand is, how much of the demand for cigarettes has been replaced by that. And I think if there were ways for the industry to cooperate better and produce higher quality stats on that, it would, it would help lots of people and particularly help make the case for, for, for how and why this is working. The other uh, area where, I mean, it's not so much cooperation but to stop squabbling I, I get a bit frustrated or, or cross when I see companies using a particular kind of favored regulatory scheme for competitive advantage I think there were stupid spats about that and it, it annoys a lot of people I mean it, it it must I'm guessing really annoy politicians and in particular it also really annoys a lot of consumer advocates who who see the industry playing games. And that's just daft as far as I'm concerned because one, you know, one of the problems that the industry had for ages is, is that smokers, people who smoked, would never, would never stand up for their habit or their cause. And suddenly, when people switch to become uh, harm reduction advocates, suddenly people are, are much more ready to speak up. And why would you, why would you jeopardize the chances of them speaking up on your behalf and helping to, to drive change. It certainly seems to be a significant side effect of giving up smoking as you become an evangelist. Um, whether you've given up smoking and, and, and not moved to tobacco harm reduction products or, or you have, you, um, yeah, we, all be, 
we all uh, should need to find that voice. And I think this, we need to get over the stick. We need to fight the stigma of, of that in our countries. But as you say, working together and collaborating, um, particularly I think on data, data really helps, um, really helps uh, regulators and legislators and politicians if they, they love a number, as does, as does the media. And it's very, it's much easier to be able to sell a story with numbers um, than than just a vibe or um, or other information. Does anyone else want to comment on this? Great, to you. Okay, uh, Andrew Manson from the UK. Um, sorry, Andrew Manson from the UK. And uh, it's great to hear the optimism, and I don't want to kind of knock the optimism at all uh, because I'm I'm an optimist myself. But uh, 10 years ago, there were a billion smokers. Today, there's still a billion sm smokers. Um, two parts of this question is, uh, in 10 years' time, do we still expect to see a billion smokers? And more importantly, in terms of making that change, we can put some of that responsibility on adverse tobacco control and this sort of thing. But at the end of the day, a question, uh, particularly for you, Joe, do you really think that the products out there are good enough in terms of affordability and performance. And from an industry point of view, I mean, not an imperial point of view, do you, do you see an acceleration and an improvement of that over the next 10 years to address those 1 billion smokers that still want to use cigarettes? Thank you. If in 10 years' time there's still a billion smokers, then harm reduction would have made little progress. Um, my expectation is there won't be um, a billion smokers and that harm reduction um, would have made progress and you would have um, a, I don't know the numbers, a percentage of those that would have quit, a percentage of those that use um, nicotine uh, containing products. The products today um, I don't think anyone's got the perfect product. Um, not every product is right for every consumer. So some consumers um, prefer nicotine pouches, some prefer heated tobacco, because they feel it's less of a compromise from the smoking experience. Some prefer um, vaping products. I suspect that those three categories will probably be the three categories in 10 years, but I'm, I'm just, I'm guessing, the same as anyone else could guess. But innovation happens quickly and it happens fast. And it doesn't just happen within the industry. Actually, a lot of it, particularly for, for vaping, happens across Europe, across Asia, um, startups that are constantly innovating to create better products. Then that coupled with the industry that is seeking to understand um, consumers, what they want, what they need. And it's, it's not as simple as just providing nicotine. There's a whole raft of behavioral and psychological reasons as to why smokers smoke and why they find it hard to switch. Um, but that innovation will, will accelerate and continue to accelerate o over the, the next decade. That's what I think will happen. Any of the other optimists on the panel? Well, yeah, I just wanted to make the point that most of the smokers are in the low and middle income countries. And they're the biggest challenge, unfortunately. I mean, we're making progress in the Western countries, in the higher income countries, but much less success there. And, um, and, and I think the WHO has a lot to blame, a lot to take a lot of the blame for that. But um, the progress seems to be very slow there, and that, that's what worries me in terms of the total numbers that we'd expect to see in the future. And I think um, Christopher Russell mentioned in one of the, in the session yesterday, about a study that said if we implemented all of the World Health Organization's recommendations and Empower's recommendations, we would reduce smoking by 2030 to, I think it was 750 million smokers. So we can't just do what we're, we can't just keep doing what we're doing now. We do need to disrupt and we do need to innovate in this area. Otherwise, we will be stuck with, you know, a growing population, but um, the same, the same number of the ne same number of smokers. Are there any other comments, questions? 
fantastic. Well, I think this shows a very good conference when no one has left, left it with a question. So I'm very pleased, and I thank you all. And I hope, oh, one, yes, please. You may have the last word at the conference, so be careful. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Uh, I'm Stefan, I'm from Sweden, uh, and I run an online uh, news outlet on vaping and harm reduction. Um, so coming from Sweden, uh, it's interesting to be here. This is my first conference I've been attending and online since a couple of years. Uh, and even though I, I write on vaping, I, I, I know what's the Swedish kind of way of handling these products and stuff like that. But that's not my, 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 my question, really. Because this, this one kind of... This is, it's not an elephant in the room, but everyone who has been vaping for a while know where these products come from. They come from China. You know, that's where everything started, really. It had very little to do with big tobacco companies uh, and, and such things. Uh, and that is what I've been kind of missing on this conference, the voice from the manufacturers in China who actually made this happen. I know the tobacco companies and many other companies uh, work with Chinese companies to produce their, their the, the devices and stuff like that, but I'm kind of missing that, that voice here. Uh, I don't know why that is, but just a feeling I got. Uh, you see them around. <laughs> but yeah, so that was, I don't know if that was a question or if that was just a statement. I'm just no, it's a very interesting reflection, and I think um, that probably is a great segue to the fact that you will have all seen some feedback uh, sheets um, about the conference, and um, we'd encourage you, I've been asked to ask you to please um, fill in those feedback forms, um, because it helps shape what the conference will look like um, next time. Uh, on that, I think I'd... You know, personally, and I'm sure on behalf of all of the panellists, I'd like to thank the organisers of this conference and obviously all of the people. But before we welcome to the stage um, the one of the founders, Paddy, to make some final remarks, could I, could I get a round of applause for the, for the final panellists? Yeah. And that, that's a round of applause for all of you for sticking it out um, till after lunch on Saturday. But now, if we could please welcome Paddy for possibly the last time on the stage. Thanks, Fiona. That sounds ominous. I have to say, Fiona is one of the few politicians that gives me any cause for optimism. Um, it just occurred to me that we're holding this conference in the country that gave us one of history's most famous heretics, Nicolaus Copernicus, whose theory that, uh, the, that, that not everything revolved around the world got him into rather a lot of trouble with the Vatican. And it just leads me to, to say that uh, to our friends in Bath, and others on the extreme wing of uh, tobacco control. It's 10 years, despite your efforts, and the heretics are still here, <laughs> and they're gonna be here for another 10 years afterwards, so we're not going anywhere. So come and join us, come and debate, come and give your arguments, and, ex and let us examine them. Examine them in a proper, rational, and respectful way. It's an open invitation, We'll host them. If anyone's watching, which I'm sure somebody is, because they'll be taking names. And, you know, let's, let's get it on. Let's have some fun. GFN, anybody who knows me knows I like to gamble. I like to gamble on horses. I like to gamble on other sports. And in 2014, we took our biggest gamble I think we've ever had by having this conference. It was a success. We had 220 people here from about, I think, about 40 countries. It moved on from being a gamble to being a challenge. 
And the challenge was exacerbated by COVID, by conflict, by international financial crises. And I have to say that the third phase of it, and today is a, a, an example of this, is it's become an unqualified success. It punches well above its weight, and it can only do that because of you. There's no magic bullet, no one's got all the answers, but the experts in this field are in this room, and this is where change will be generated, here. I think some of the elements that have made it a success, it's affordable. We're not in this business to make money. It's inclusive. We want all the stakeholders here. We don't exclude anybody. We try to make it more inclusive by offering the proceedings live, online, to people who are unable, for whatever reason, to be here. And it will always remain that way. It's transparent. People don't make declarations of, of conflicts of interest, but they do say who they are, and they do say who they work for. And I think that's quite enough. And most importantly, and we've heard it throughout today and previous days, everything we do is driven by evidence. It's not speculation, it's not ideology, it's evidence. And I think that's another thing that we will retain and hopefully retain the integrity of the whole enterprise through that. I think that um, the other thing I'd like to say, and Hennage at the, in the opening session said, it's quite right, if it wasn't for the consumers, we wouldn't be here. And we will always maintain consumers at the heart of everything we do. And they will have a large part to play in both the design and the delivery of this event now and going forward. Uh, highlights from the event for me. Roberto's lecture, despite the fact that he went 15 minutes over, and I'm a time fascist and he knows it, was absolutely wonderful. He delivered very, very important messages, but with humor and a simplicity that this is not, I'm gonna say this is not rocket science, despite the fact that you're a rocket scientist, but it, it's a simple, it, there's, there's some very simple facts in this. It's summed up by the, 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 the vapors mantra from many years ago, which is e-cigs save lives. And you know, it's not just e-cigs now. It's as, it, it's as Joe was saying, it's, it's, it's a range of products that are now on the market and available. And we can't do this without the full toolkit. People need to know that there's something out there for them. Obviously, I was delighted that Jerry received due recognition for his efforts. Um, I'm not so sure he didn't know he was going to get it, but uh, Jess, and I worked very, Jess and I worked very hard to prevent him finding out. Um, and it would have been him here today, but he had a pressing engagement back in London. So his words to me were, oh, you might as well do it. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, I think... The other, the other highlights are seeing people like Alex Wodak, Nick Croft, people who I'd worked with in former lives of the International Harm Reduction Association, seeing the crossover that people understand between those two fields. We will continue, and a priority for us will be to mainstream tobacco harm reduction, because unless we do, we're not going to get anywhere. It's going to be a niche market that nobody cares about. The energy in the room and the fact that so many people are still here and we haven't locked the doors, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm so impressed. I'm so overwhelmed by it. So we must be doing something right. And I think just a few things that I do think we did right. We've always been innovative. We've always tried to innovate. Sometimes my ideas on innovation have caused an awful lot of people an awful lot of grief because they have to deliver them. But we didn't cave in when we had COVID. We went online. 
And we didn't just leave it that, oh, we can go back to do everything as we did. We've developed and evolved the online system, the hybrids, everything else. We've established GFN TV to keep the conversation going throughout the year. We've done away with posters. I have to say that we did away with posters primarily because they took all the natural light out of the building. Uh, but we've given people an opportunity to do something much more creative, and we've used the, the, the uh, medium of GFN 5s. They endure. They're there forever. They're part of an archive that's searchable. So your work is there forever for everybody to see, and it's free to access for anybody globally. We've um, we brought in the commentary team, which I think has been quite successful. And if nothing else, it's given a bit of free media training to quite a number of people. And we've also added more languages. And using new technologies, we can do that at, a, at, a, at an affordable rate, which opens up the discussion and the debate to lots more people. This year, we've had English, uh, well, we've had English as I understand it, and we've had Spanish and we've had Russian. But we've also had a few, a, a few sessions where we've been able to use Chinese, and that will be one that we will have in the full package for next year. And we'll continue to expand that as, as time goes on. Um, I've got to say a few thank yous. I've got about four pages here, so I'll run through them as quickly as I can. I mean, firstly, thanks to all of you. Thank you for coming. We must be doing something right, but um, as Fiona said, please tell us what it is on those feedback forms, because we really do value the opinions that everybody here has. I've got to say thank you to all of the hosts, the speakers, the panelists, and those who submitted GFN 5s. You've made this a real pleasure to be part of. Our team, amazing people. We have so many people who work so hard on this, and I can't mention them all, but I mean, Jess and Jagos, as the program director and the technical director, have worked wonders. And Michal, who has worked with us for many years now, and his crew, who provided technical facilities, and I, I, words fail me for the team around Camille, who manages to make all of these things work and actually keeps it live. I don't know how he does it. And uh, I don't know what we'd do without them. Although there is a limit to how much we're prepared to pay. Um, <laughs> all, of the, all, of the, all of the tech team that surround him, all of the administrative and finance team, with Joanna and Bisola and Zuza, who've made entering the building and running the conference extremely easy. Bartek, who's done all of the design for the program, for all of these, all, all of these backdrops, etc. It's, it's just an amazing job that they've all done. Um, I'm delighted that we've had a massive presence from our scholars this year, and delighted even more that we've managed to award the second tranche of Kevin Malloy Fellowships. Kevin, as most of you will know, was a very, very close friend of mine over many years. And it's lovely to see those awards in his memory. Um, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd really like to thank the exhibitors for Isentech and to Charlie for chairing the proceedings of Isentech the other day. It's another innovation that we brought in, which I think is an incredibly important one. It's an opportunity to demonstrate science and not sell products. It's not a business-to-business -business experience. It's a business-to-customer experience, which is, I think, quite an important issue. To our media partners, to Will, to Will and his team from Filter, to Two First, our first Chinese media partner from Shenzhen, Planet of the Vapes, who many people will know. Uh, Red from South America. Um, Tobacco Intelligence, who've been a long time supporter, and Vaping Today. They've been really, really instrumental in assisting us to deliver and get the message across. And obviously, um, 
overwhelmed by the work that Ruth and Ollie have done in terms of engagement with media. And, you know, thank you to any journalists who are still here. Uh, I hope I'm not putting you off, and I hope you'll come back next year. Well, going forward, challenges. COP. COP's the next item on, on the agenda. COP is going to be a challenge. But I think we'll rise and meet that. I know there's plans afoot for consumers to have a robust, a robust presence. If I was a gambling man, I would say that is likely to be outside the building rather than in it, but nevertheless a robust presence. I think that the political and ideological barriers that we face are going to be manifest within that meeting. And what we need to do is we need to be ready to take them on. And when we reconvene here next year, we need to have a proper review of what's gone on and what we need to do going forward. What we've got to do with this is get ahead of the game, because these people are getting better organised. And they are not people with any um, humanistic intent behind them. They're politically driven, they're ideologically driven. And science is just something that sits there on the side. The campaigns orchestrated by Bloomberg's funded activities around misinformation are something else that we, need to, that we need to address. I mean, we heard a lot about it in a session prior to this one. You know, the, the ad hominem attacks, the outrageous lies and distortions. We need to be ready to meet those, and we need to have the information ready to confront the bad science. So another thing to, to be concerned about. The other thing that concerns me, and I hope that this goes some way, this conference and this event goes some way to help him with it, is I fear for the stress and the strain that's placed on a very small number of people with very, very limited resources who are trying to confront a well-organized campaign and a well-funded campaign. And I fear for people's burnout, because it happens. There are a lot of people who used to come to this event when it first started, a lot of consumers, who dropped out. They gave up because they were battered and they were bruised and they just didn't want to do it anymore. I don't want to see that happen to anybody and I certainly don't want to see it happen to the enthusiastic people we've seen here over the past week. So on that, I'm not going to get burnt out. I'm going. But I have to say that although I will not have any executive role any longer within the company, I will still be working in some capacities for it. But I'm delighted that we're handing over the responsibility for GFN next year and probably for many years to come, depending on her sanity and burnout, to, to Jess. Now, Jess has put the programme together this year. I've helped but it's her programme, and she's really, really worked hard to do it. Shagosh has made wonderful arrangements for the technology oh, to deliver the whole thing. And I'm absolutely confident, and in those two, supported by the other directors within our organisation, the future is absolutely safe. So it just remains for me to say thank you. It's been a blast. And I look forward to sitting where you are next year and saying... I'm sorry, that's not right. <laughs> and and being, a, being a critical friend to the event. So we'll see you all here on the 12th of June next year. Same time, same place. Four days of debate and not a little fun, I hope. So all it remains for me to say is safe home and see you in 2024. Thank you.